Is it on? Okay, testing, testing. I hope everyone can hear us. Just give us a minute, please. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah? Testing, okay, thank you. Excellent. Um, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening. And thank you all so much for joining us uh, online and all of you who are here with us in New York at the Interchurch Center. Um, we're having a rainy morning at the beginning of the SDG Summit week. Um, and so we look forward to having this discussion with all of you uh, today. Uh, so thanks so much for, for joining and being part of this a uh, great discussion. We're organizing this event as a side event to the International Conference on Sustainable Development. Uh, this is an event titled Think Globally, Act Systemically, Driving Sustainable Change at the UN SDG Summit. So you're joining us uh, live in New York and online. Uh, with our discussion here today, we want to uh, make a contribution to the momentum that we hope will be created in the international arena with the UN SDG Summit and the UN General Assembly that are taking place uh, this week in New York. Um, focusing on climate resilience, human and planetary health, and decarbonization of cities, this event will showcase how systemic solutions can drive transformational change. The three thematic panels will facilitate the exchange of perspectives and ideas, identifying crucial linkages and potential for collaboration. Supported by Sustainable Development Solutions Network, SDSN, the event is convened by Arsinoe and Impetus, EU-funded projects on climate adaptation in Europe. A couple of words about these projects. So the Arsinoe project is the one that is aiming at creating climate resilient regions through innovations and systemic solutions. With Arsinoe, uh, the idea is to shape pathways to resilience by bringing together the systems innovation approach and climate innovation window. And we'll hear about these in a minute. So the aim is to build an ecosystem for climate change adaptation solutions. This approach is showcased in nine demonstrators or case studies. So as a proof of concept with regards to its applicability, replicability, potential, and efficacy. On the other hand, the impetus project's objective is to turn climate commitments into tangible, urgent actions to protect communities and the planet. Much of its activity centers around what is called resilience knowledge boosters based at the project's demonstration sites. The resilience knowledge boosters provide a place for stakeholders to engage and create together as a network, they will provide routes for knowledge flow and for successful climate adaptation approaches to reach other communities that need them. Sophia and I here today are from UNSDSN, uh, standing for UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. We are partner in both Arsinoe and Impetus projects, um, and we are the world's leading network of knowledge institutions that promote integrated approaches to implement the SDGs as well as the Paris Climate Agreement. And we do so through education, research, policy analysis, and global cooperation. For the next few hours, we'll be discussing the role of systems thinking in tackling climate change, improving health, and transforming cities. So to start, Kirsten Dunrup from EIT Climate Kick will set the stage for the discussion by highlighting the importance of systemic approaches. In the first panel on climate resilience, Arsinoe and Impetus speakers will be joined by the representatives of their sister projects, Transformer and Resilience, to show us how an ecosystem of multi-stakeholder projects contributes to transformational change. In the second panel, we will uh, shed light on the role of system thinking in transforming cities and communities, where we will hear from uh, uh, different perspectives from the CDS, 2030 project, the EIT Climate Kick, the Bolivian Private University, as well as Monash University. The third panel will focus on the systemic 
uh, risks to human and planetary health, providing insights from Columbia University, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Ministry of Health of Brazil, and Healthcare Without Harm. Lastly, we will be hearing from Sir Andy Haynes from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who will be providing us with some closing remarks. With this, the hybrid part of the event will officially conclude, while in-person participants will be invited for a networking lunch. We will be having then another session later on in this afternoon, starting at 1.30 uh, p.m. New York time, on the role of multi-stakeholder partnerships in addressing uh, complex challenges, a case study uh, inspired by the Spanish example. Finally, let us share with you a few housekeeping rules. After each panel, we'll have questions from the audience. If you join us online, please use the Q&A function. And those present in the room, please raise your hand and we'll pass the microphone to you. Please also note that this event will be recorded. Now, without further ado, please welcome Kirsten Dunlop, CEO, CEO of EIT Climate Kicks, Kick, Europe's largest climate innovation agency and community. Her career spans academia, consulting, banking, insurance, strategy, design, innovation, and leadership across three continents. Her vision for EIT Climate Kick um, is to offer a capability in systems transformation, resilience, and regeneration through innovation. Kirsten, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our a strangely empty, busy, rainy New York with the streets beginning to be shut down. There's a word in English which comes to mind when I think of what is happening this week, what has been happened, what has been happening with the review of the global stock take, what is happening in the discussions that are happening across this entire city and across the world. The world, the word is discombobulation, a sense of confusion, alienation, competing tendencies, tensions, and a deep unease about how we find paths forward, find ways to do things that are profoundly structurally different to the ways in which we have been working until now. I wanted to open this conference with some reflections on the importance of starting New York Climate Week with a session that welcomes and argues for how we might shift our paradigms, not just of uh, emissions and of ways of living, but our paradigms of working towards that and our paradigms of mobilizing policy, decision-making, funding, and action and engagement at multi-scale and multi-level and multi-actor ways. The observation I would make is that at the moment, we continue in large measure to iterate on a system that is broken. And in particular, we iterate on a system that is mechanistic and that is grounded in principles of mechanistic, log logical, linear thinking. If you look at the patterns around climate action, climate investment, and climate innovation, they are still fundamentally grounded in the individual sectors, the sectoral logics, the individual budgets, the treasuries and ministers across all governments in the world are responsible for dealing with. They are grounded in the silos of our thinking about the ways in which the world is stitched together, and they are grounded in the fragments of what people can get their hands on or in individual impact theses attached to a desire to be able to point to something and say, I did that. So ultimately, we end up with a patchwork of individually important, but nonetheless not sufficient initiatives. We are not managing to get the entire system of effects to go fast enough, far enough, or fair enough. And that gives us a design problem, an implementation problem, and a fundamental paradigm shift problem when it comes to the way in which we think about resource mobilization, incentives, benefits, and our underlying mechanisms for encouraging people to work. I wish to introduce into this two terms. One is holistic, the other is systemic. They are not the same. We need to do both. We need to work on changing whole places and we need to work systemically in those whole places to unlock and tap into the ways in which the dynamics of interconnectedness and interrelatedness begin to work with us and for us and on us. 
And that requires us to shift our understanding of the ways in which we think. In a European context, much is being done on a place-based focus for many reasons that ultimately boil down to something that has to do with the power of intuition. If you work with people in a place, the abstract constructs around systemic thinking, systems innovation, dissolve into a practical sense of, yes, I know if I live in a city, stuff is connected. That if something changes in the way in which garbage is collected or something changes in the way in which planning laws are, are enforced, other things get affected by that. It is related. And it is much easier to work ground up and bottom up with communities and top down with policymakers and sideways with industry and SME in ways that practically begin to connect the notion of holistic, the notion of systemic with the notion of actions in which people can participate, but most importantly, relationships that they have to start negotiating and contracting around. So there's a plea and a, and a recognition that this is something we need to learn how to do. And it does require us to unlearn some of the assumptions and habits we have in the ways in which we assume success can be achieved. The second reflection I wanted to make has to do with the ways in which we have constructed narratives around change. Our focus has been on emissions. Rightly so, because at this particular point in time, looking at the latest scientific evidence for feedback loops globally in terms of climatic change, we have to get emissions down as quickly as possible, or we lose the social stability, political stability, and economic stability that gives us space to do anything at all. And I think there, one of the things we really need to think about is as conflict and as fear and uncertainty hit us in increasing waves of frequency, as we find it less space to recover from each event, less time, it becomes harder and harder for us to act with ambition, with vision, with courage, and with spaciousness. We need somehow to buy time for that spaciousness. And there, I think one of the challenges we have is by making it all about emissions, by making the stock take all about a focus on what hits emissions, we continue to slip sideways from the problem that this is about people. We are talking about something that has to achieve human, human transformation which requires a very different way of thinking about discourse and narratives. In Madrid, we are wrestling with the fact that the latest story, the latest meme circulating on the streets is that the idea of a 15 minute city in which proximity is a mechanism for reducing the demand on resources and emissions is a European plot to lock people up in ghettos. It's the kind of anti-constructive, anti anti-collective, anti-transformative narrative that begins to stick for people because what else is there? Where are the alternative narratives of what it means to transform that is about people, that is about well-being, that is about living in a sustainable world that is attractive, aspirational, beautiful, and significantly better than the current ways in which we are living? Without those narratives, without making this about people, we are stuck in a technical discourse of exactly what net zero means and what that ultimately arrives for for people. There is something in here about shifting the way in which we are cap capable of bringing our innovation approaches to envision alternatives and to demonstrate those alternatives. And I think you'll hear a lot this morning about different projects that are attempting to do exactly that. Remembering that 80% of emissions are locked in at the design stage of products, services, and policy decisions. 80%. We have a huge challenge to get upstream of ourselves and of our own assumptions. And lastly, I want to bring in a reflection, thinking back to my sense of coming into this week with this sense of, disc of, on the one hand, an enormous force of will in optimism and hope and the determination to make something happen, and a recognition that that stands on a knife edge with despair. That for me personally, for every single one of us, I think I experience a daily walking on a knife edge, a daily experience of needing to reinvest in my own resilience, my own capacity to hold firmly open the determination for optimism and for the possibility of doing the impossible. 
And you'll hear about that in the message about the European missions and what Europe is attempting to achieve. I think there are two things that matter enormously here. When you look at the investment of time that many of us are making, many of us are still competing, competing to fundraise, competing to raise awareness about our individual activities, competing to speak about one method versus another method, investing an enormous amount of time in a friction cost we can ill afford. The time for deep collaboration in order to achieve deep systemic effects, interrelation, relationships, the importance of inter intervening on the parts of our cities and our regions and our countries and our industrial value chains, on the relationships between those parts, on the rules that govern those relationships, and on the mindsets that look for and assume what to expect. That is essential. And the work that we need to do needs to be multi-scale, multi-actor, and multi-level, empowering people to make decisions flexibly, quickly, and in context. This, I hope, is what many of us will be discussing, not the theory, but the practice of how to try to do that and how to try to continue to learn how to do this with all of the failures, the successes, the adjustments, and the sense of determined optimism and hope in trying and continuing to try. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Dunlop, for these uh, very inspiring uh, words of hope above all, and for um, giving us a sense of connection that we need to be creating between holistic, systemic, between the missions and the uh, humans that uh, we all should be uh, changing and, and working on. Um, I won't be I, I won't be uh, very long, so let's move uh, straight away into our first uh, panel that will be uh, moderated by uh, the SDSN's Vice President um, Maria Cortez Puch. Um, we will be focusing on uh, building climate resilience through systemic solutions. So just please give us a, a moment, and we will get our st started with our first uh, panel and first discussion. So. Um, we will be welcoming um, several speakers here in person, but also um, on online. Thank you very much. Great. So um, thank you everyone who made it uh, through the rain and those that have been waiting for us to start online. Um, indeed, this first panel is going to be discussing climate resilience. It's going to be discussing it under the framework of four European projects, Arsinoe, Impetus, Transformer, and Resilience. These projects have our sisters projects, and this is uh, an attempt by the European Commission to indeed break what uh, Kirsten called this patchwork of individually great projects. Um, they are massive uh, projects with between 30 to 40 members, each of them, that are also collaborating across each of them to try to share learnings, to make sure that we are not duplicating, to make sure that we are uh, finding levers levers to, to uh, break uh, these negative cycles. Um, I'm going to start with Chrissy uh, Laspidou. Uh, she coordinates the Arsinoe project. She's the professor at the University of Thessaly. Yeah. Uh, and Vice President of Research and Technology at Water Europe. And I think, Chrissy, before you start uh, with your few words about the project and specifically how does the project use this systemic uh, focus, I want to ask you uh, just for one minute to tell us about what's happened in your university, which yeah. clearly illustrates um, what we are facing and, and perhaps puts us a little bit uh, in this despair mode yes. but hopefully only to turn us into the hope yes uh, thank you thank you for this yeah i totally appreciated the fact that uh, uh the this feeling of despair and i i must say it is not shared by everyone which uh, uh, puts us in a difficult position uh when we go through crisis so i i am at the university of thessaly and uh, our region thessaly was hurt enormously these uh, 
uh, past, uh, I mean, it, it's been about, I don't know, 10 days or something like that, that we had uh, unbelievable damage. We had floods, uh, the uh, whole villages got buried under uh, water and mud. Uh, our university has been uh, non-operational since then. We we will see where the, the all the funding is handled in the research committee. They are they had two meters of mud and water, so uh, and uh, it looks like the one thousand year storm happened. But uh, in two thousand twenty, we had something of uh, lesser uh, importance, but st uh, lesser severity, but still very, very damaging. So uh, it is obvious that, um, uh, you know, these events will become more and more frequent. And we as scientists need to adjust our uh, models because uh, the 1000 year things will be happening every 10 years, um, it looks like. And uh, it, the the damage in uh, uh, animals, because uh, Thessaly is uh, the most agricultural region in Greece, the basic uh, where everything is produced. So I don't know how many thousands of animals are dead and uh, uh, all the crops, of course, are damaged. And um, I, I don't know how we will recover. This comes after um, extreme fires that we had in Greece and a large part of uh, the country, uh, especially where I come from. I mean, I live in Thessaly, but I come from Thrace, which is up in the north. And that part, we had this very precious uh, forest there was a very, like I said, very precious ecosystem that a large part of it is burned from forest fires. So we either go uh, from forest fires to um, to the floods, which and, and the heat. We had extreme heat also. So it looks like the we are facing constantly crisis. We need to get used to this mode. And now the winter is coming. You know, and even in places like Greece. Uh, not many, I don't know, a couple of years ago, we had extreme snowfall. So even in, in Athens, where you would not expect that, but the, the whole city got paralyzed and people were without power for a week or so, you know, uh, because of extreme snowfall. So uh, things are getting extreme and I'm worried uh, a little bit personally, actually, you know, what we are giving to our, you know, to our children, <laughs> what kind of world we're giving them and how we're going into the 2030s and 40s and 50s and wh where the models look very grim. You know, the, the situation does not look good. And uh, you see that the, you know, the mitigation is not taken very seriously. Okay, let me go back now to speak about Arsinoe and what we are trying to do. So Arsinoe, uh, is a great, great project, very ambitious, uh, 15 million uh, euros, 41 partners, really, um, uh, you know, diverse. We have nine case studies, as was said before. Uh, we are designing uh, innovation solutions for climate adaptation. Adaptation, of course, is done locally in the communities. Uh, and uh, we are, uh, even though traditionally you would have the uh, the scientists and the technology providers bringing in the consortium their technologies beforehand. So when you write the proposal, you decide what you will do in each case study. In our case, our innovation is that we did not pre-decide that, but we uh, put together a lot of effort uh, in uh, bringing the stakeholders together and creating these living labs where they all interact and the, um, uh, where they all understand the problem, they define the scope, they uh, develop a vision of where they want to be, and then we see how how to get there. But this is not ours, so so it is very very uh, bottom up. And we've been talking about bottom up in other projects, but this one is real because we don't know beforehand what we are implementing. And we are letting the people, the stakeholders decide. This is not easy, no, not in a country like Greece, where you know we, we have a case study in Athens, uh, where you know I, I'm leading, and that is uh, you know the, the, our our societies are not so. Uh, I mean, there is all these conflicting interests, and they're not so mature in uh, sharing and uh, opening up uh, even the data, the, uh, their ideas, and uh, uh, looking for this common good. And, and we are looking into why this is more 
um so you know in maybe in the south so i i will even say that that even in the south of europe you might see that uh, uh, may, maybe because people go through uh, very difficult also economic situations uh, for years i mean uh, the environment and all these things take a little bit of a second second chair so they they're not on the top of the agenda so um so this is uh, it, it is not easy to bring these people together to make them interested to make them talk about the threats uh, in a way the the new crisis help us so now it is becoming like guys come on <laughs> as you see we're not joking here the the next crisis will hit you you know it will hit you you will not maybe this time you didn't but the next time you will be hit and so you need to act so all these and we're trying to engage the community which like i said is not easy but this is what we're trying to do and then uh, we have the the climate innovation window where we are trying to bring in all the innovators with their ideas uh, and, and bring them uh, in contact with the problem owners. So create this bridge, which is not so easy to, to cover. We have open calls where, uh, so the, the, the living labs, the society decides what the innovations want to be. Then we issue a call and we invite all these innovators to come and submit uh, their ideas and increase the TRL of their technologies. And this, of course, is uh, really uh, speeds up innovation and speeds up what, uh, um, you know, what we want. We want also to, to innovate, to create opportunity and all that stuff. And then we decide the pathways. How can we get there? Now that we know what the innovation is, what are the socioeconomic, what are the financial pathways? How do we fund these solutions? And th that's when the the cities and the regions get interested when you tell them we will design for you a way to actually finance these solutions then they get interested and the money is there we just need to uh, be more mature with the projects in order to be able to do this but this is just the, the first uh, thing so let me stop here right thank you very much Chrissy and uh, I think Christian already mentioned that it's not easy to work in this new way collaborating, breaking uh, sectors. But uh, this is a very interesting project where this is happening. It's it's hard, you've said it, it's a bit chaotic, but we're seeing it in practice, how this can actually be done. And I'm going to pass the floor to uh, Joanna Diaz-Pond, who is Senior Researcher in Governance at Eurocat and Water, Air and, so and the Water, Air and Soil Unit. And she's going to actually tell us a bit more about that from the impetus perspective. Thank you, Maria. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much to UNSDSN and ICDS for giving us the opportunity to share these this projects and these initiatives in this in this panel and in this specific um, environment. Well, I'm hearing representation just as my colleagues of uh, Eureka, the uh, research foundation in in Catalonia, and also in representation of Impetus, which is. Uh, exactly a project similar to what we are talking, a project with 32 partners in eight European countries in Europe uh, that include organizations ranging from research, uh, regional government, businesses, utilities, citizens, um, and many more, like local communities and so on. Impetus is precisely about thinking systemically, we think, uh, to, well, we use this word to co-create knowledge um, and to co-create innovative uh, knowledge for climate adaptation. Uh, systemic thinking in uh, in this project is also, I think, we think, is understood as sharing a common body of knowledge. And uh, I wanted to focus this uh, intervention on this because sharing a common body of knowledge is a challenge that started when we started talking about sustainable development in the 80s. Uh, social scientists, and I am a social scientist myself, um, we know that knowledge is aligned with the social orders where it is produced. But as I like to mention Eleanor Armstrong because she's a woman and because she, she's worked with all these things about communal resources. Uh, she said that social sciences and natural sciences have developed independently from ecological sciences and their integration is precisely, I, we think the problem that we are discussing here today, um, because systems thinking is, t is key to see reality as a, as a unity. Uh, disciplines cannot work in isolation. We see that in this sort of European 
pro projects, huge projects where many disciplines gather together. Um, when um, the concept emerged, the concept of sustainable development emerged in the in the eighties, we saw uh, we already saw that it was it was a knowledge intensive process, and here we are thirty years later, admitting that it was a tougher challenge than than expected, and that many concerns exist, just as Kirsten said in in, in her beautiful presentation. So. Um, uh, the EU um, has devoted millions of euros to this and is still investing a lot of money in this through programs like Horizon or the Green Deal. And Impetus is one such effort, just like Arsinoe and others that we'll be presenting uh, here today. Um, the, the project, well, we're talking again, just as with Arsino, about seven demo sites in different climatic bioclimatic regions of Europe. Uh, these demo sites will um, work for three, four years to scale up innovative solutions and, and to support businesses and, and communities in climate adaptation. So Impetus is about co-designing in the end and implementing a, a digital platform. So when we talk about what, what this is gonna be, people ask us, but what's Impetus gonna be in the end? Well. Um, it will implement a digital knowledge platform with tested climate ad adaptation solutions for key community systems such as uh, water, agriculture, fisheries, infrastructure, health, and well, these bioregions include um, the continental weather, the coastal weather, the Mediterranean weather. We were listening to this devastating um uh stories from from uh, greece the atlantic weather the arctic weather the boreal weather and mountainous uh, regions so you see the variety is enormous uh, we're, we're talking about bioregions finding solutions for absolutely different um realities um so this truly is a beautiful project uh, we think it will test and share Technolo technical and non-technical innovation, so it's not all about technology, and uh, ranging from solutions to fight coastal erosion, to early warning systems for bathing or drinking water, to adapt to water um, supply scarcity, which is a problem, like for example, myself uh, coming from Barcelona, we have got the opposite problem, water scarcity uh, for agriculture, and uh, flash flooding from irregular rainfall which is also what we're seeing these days. Um, well, as well as dealing with um, land use conflicts arising from all these problems and, and, and economic impacts uh, from all the economic activities that suffer the effects of all this. So, well, uh, the project is all about systems thinking because it integrates research, decision-making, active communities, especially local communities. So the people, the citizens, um, localized communication, which is something that uh, we also think is very important and, and very many different disciplines from natural sciences, social sciences, artificial intelligence, real time data sets, uh, data sets as Michael Lee Laya will, will tell us right now. So, well, yes, um, systems thinking, uh, which is the issue here today, uh, well, this morning can be seen as a very abstract thing in practice. I was talking to Chrissy just a few minutes ago about how social scientists tend to be very abstract about, the, about all this and tend to theorize very much and, and talk and talk and talk and write. But it is a powerful framework to avoid reductionism. And there is one thing that I would like to point out in, in this short intervention just to finish and, and trigger discussion later. Think, thinking systemic, systemically requires a social culture based on shared principles and priorities. This is what can facilitate co-creation in the end. So sharing certain principles, being uh, agreeing on certain priorities, which is something we've been fighting in the whole world. You will see this these days here in, in New York. So when we talk about um, impetus, uh, what's at the heart of this project is seven bioregions in Europe uh, with totally different cultures and totally different climate adaptation challenges, 
but aiming to uh, share values and priorities to co-create this systemic knowledge, which I, uh, which we think uh, in the project that this is it's actually the true sustainability challenge and what we're excited about facing the very many difficulties that we will surely find in our way. So I'll leave it here. Wonderful. So let's go directly to, to Laia. Laia Romero is the co-founder and CEO of Lobelia Earth, also part of the Impetus uh, program. Go ahead, please. Thank you so much. Um, at Lo we are partners in the Impetus project, uh, and we are climate experts. We are oceanographers, um, physicists, mathematicians, experts on forestry, agriculture, vulnerability, developers. And what we provide is an evidence-based approach to these design decisions. These, th the fact that design decisions are locked, it's a very important fact that uh, Kirsten mentioned in, in the introduction that I think we all uh, appreciated a lot. And an evidence-based approach helps a lot in unlocking these decisions. When we talk about design, we talk about um, adaptation design and also mitigation, but mainly in impetus adaptation. And one thing that I would like to, to, to bring to the discussion is the fact that we are discussing here projects in which Europe has invested largely in, in development of these, of these solutions and that it's very important to remember that this investment, that investment in adaptation brings benefits, brings savings, and most importantly, brings social resilience. And so, because there is a whole um, speech about mm, these are huge projects, but they are extremely important. And, and investment goes way farther than this. This is just the beginning, really, as we are as we are saying, and it's needed. So what we provide in Impetus is the data from Earth observation, climate data, um, economic impact data, vulnerability information on different demo sites. And we're looking at things like, well, this is a, a satellite observation on the Greece flooding that Chrissy was mentioning um, as an example. But we're looking at flooding uh, for the implementation of nature-based solutions. We're looking at water stress for urban and pre-urban development. We're looking at the impact because extreme drought and heat extremes produce an impact which creates conflict socially and economically. So we're providing data on that as well, how hazards have um, a very clear impact on the design of new critical infrastructure. And, and basically that like evidence-based data and information that it is publicly available. And it's important to count with the um, with experts that will help in a multi-actor uh, environment take these, these, design these solutions and, and do those implementations. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move along to our colleagues uh, online. We have uh, Jan Kools, who is a research manager at the University of Antwerp um, within the Institute of Environment and Sustainable Development. He's going to tell us a bit more about the Transformar project, also one of the sister projects. Jan, yeah. over to you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Indeed, uh, Transformer is a, is a sister project. So you recognize that we, we, we will do like a similar approach. And that is also, I think, like, like an innovative thing in, 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 in Europe that, uh, that we, we want to have like research projects that, that um, bring practical applications, right? So, uh, just if you if you talk to like 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 authorities uh, sometimes they 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 don't have like see the practical value of research projects huh? but in this in this project in transformer and and in the system project we do like to work together to make like some change and we work as as you realize to, together with like local authorities and local actors or at well at the local level and that is like 
particularly challenging because they are, of course, like most uh, struggling with the uh, with the climate risks. But also they need to take action, and that is often where where also a bit the bottleneck is, right? Like like a lot of the data centers, a lot of the early warning centers, they are not at a local level; they are nationally managed or managed by an authority. So what do local actors do then basically to to use like an early warning system so so in terms of as as an example like early warning system is of course a digital uh, solution so one uh, aspect in, uh, in in transform is that we see okay how can we respond basically if you get like 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 responses another thing that also Chrissy already mentioned is like like pathways where do we want to go so in in many countries like like uh yeah, like in Europe, there are like adaptation plans already, sometimes at national level, sometimes at city level, but often they're made by like an adaptation unit. So that is like one one department or something of two or three people or something. But that that doesn't mean that they get implemented. So so what we do also in these projects is is looking at the local level. Okay, now how how can we not move? What's now needed? And and then in transformer we uh, the same as as the other projects. We look at at like which technology can work, like sensors, early warning, uh, uh, stormwater treatment. We look at 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 um, financial aspects as well. How to attract more money. Uh, like for example, Guadeloupe is one of our cases, an overseas area that is like <laughs> more or less in the New York time zone. Um, so it's 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 under the French Ministry, French Island, right? So it, uh, we are setting up an adaptation fund, and, and an adaptation fund is is in a way an innovative financial vehicle that that brings like that that pools basically like the resources. Because an adaptation measure, it can be agriculture, can be water, can be smart city, can be whatever. But if they're all in different departments, then of course they each do their own bits, and that is going to be a bit too slow, and that and then they don't evolve like more. So with the adaptation fund, we try to to bring the to the pooling to we we pool the resources of various ministries, but also uh, companies to bring the money together and come up with like a joint project. And the idea is that we set it up with Transformer, but of course they bring in their own money. It's, it's not that, that we are like like setting up like an envelope or something. Um, let's see. Uh, an, an, another aspect, of course, is also what 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 can private citizens do? Like in Finland, we work with uh, the city of La Peranta. Um, and they also have like issues, of course, not with heat waves and so, but of course, there's a lot of flooding as well. And and if you want to invest like a nature based solution or you want to to retain water or make like reservoirs or so, the public, well, they the, the government, they, they normally invest on their own land. But of course, there's so much private land. So, and, and, and so we are now also seeing in Finland what can be done basically. On private land, how could we? How could we convince like citizens? What 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 are they willing to willing to do? What how could they even invest on their own land? So so and so these are like examples basically of how we can make a change, or like a systemic change. All all the small bits in a bit look look maybe like all small uh, pieces, but but. I think in Europe, with this ambition of the adaptation mission, there's like progress that we are making, and we do <laughs> seem to go forward, even though this summer uh, has been like a bit disastrous in terms of natural disasters everywhere in Europe, but also that wakes people up in a way, I think. Um, yeah, so that's a bit in short about Transformer. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jan. We're also going to hear from Leon Capetas, who should be also joining online. He's the project lead of the Europe and the Middle East and Climate Resilience Resilient Cities Network, um, joining us to discuss uh, re the Resilience Project, which is the fourth sister project. Yes, hello. Hello, everyone. And uh, I'm sorry, and it's a pity that I cannot be there uh, in your uh, lovely company. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about resilience. Uh, as you said, it's a sister project, but it's a little bit different. Uh, 
The other three projects presented are innovation actions from the Commission. So the Commission is funding uh, research uh, to be done and be quite applied. Uh, we are a coordination and support action. What does that mean from the Commission? That means that we don't want to produce primary research. We want to understand the innovations, whether they're technological, policy-related, business model-related uh, innovations, and to see how they can be understood by other uh, regions and reproduced. So when I was invited to this uh, panel, I thought, what is our, actually our role in uh, systems thinking? And I thought that it's a bit like a fractal. Uh, if you guys, these other projects are creating innovations, how do we scale this up and have the similar structure uh, of innovation? That's a system as, as well. So uh, what we do basically is uh, package this knowledge that the projects, uh, these projects are producing, but also other relevant projects uh, funded by uh, national government or uh, at the uh, EU level and uh, take them uh, to the cities, to the regions. Uh, for instance, we do this through different uh, channels and different formats. It could be workshops. It could be mentoring programs between uh, city officials that helps a lot with capacity building. It could be through twinning activities between uh, cities as well. So as you know, cities don't learn better from a scientist, they learn from each other because they think in the same way. Um, we also have uh, uh, produced materials, uh, learning also from the innovation actions on how we can uh, develop uh, pathways uh, that uh, create projects that deliver against resilience indicators. So we avoid maladaptation. Uh, and we do all this aligned to and in support of the uh, European uh, mission on uh, adaptation to climate change. So that is very important that we don't do our own thing. We are all under the same umbrella and that brings uh, a lot of efficiency. We're also testing these approaches in uh, seven focus regions. We have given an emphasis to the more vulnerable regions and uh, low capacity. Uh, so it's a little bit early, to be honest, to report results. Uh, we're still in the needs assessment phase, engaging with them, uh, coupling them. Uh, in October, for instance, we have the European Regional um, Re uh, Resilience Forum, sorry. Uh, and uh, we do some mentoring activities. That is the first time we bring uh, um, cities that have developed innovations with uh, the cities that want to learn more about them. So I'll leave it uh, to this. Uh, and of course, we welcome uh, any input, new policy, innovations, or any sort of innovation that uh, you want to communicate. Uh, we're happy to hear from you and uh, uh, uplift it. Thank you very much, Leon. So we're going to open up the floor to questions from the audience here, but also online. I think there were three themes that came through all of the presentations that Kirsten had also mentioned. So this idea of how do we develop a vision of where we want to go. Uh, Jan was saying this cannot be done by a department of adaptation somewhere in a ministry. Uh, so these projects have an innovative approach on that. Um, this idea of working collaboratively. Um, that these projects are also very innovative, uh, working in massive consortiums, but then across these uh, consortiums. And then also this idea that at the local level, is it a city or a small community, the system itself uh, stops being so abstract and becomes very concrete because the interactions are, are quite uh, clear, right? Um, so uh, there's a question from in the chat here um, that is saying, I see the volume, uh, the value of investing in climate adaptation um, as it means uh, that we would become more resilient, but is it not more efficient and durable to address the root cause of climate change? So we would go back to what Kirsten was saying, do we need to focus uh, on mitigation or do we need a, a bit more of a, of not just focusing on mitigation? Does anyone want to take this question? Chrissy. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, 
we don't have to choose. <laughs> we should do both. So uh, definitely not just uh, uh, adaptation. See, the thing is, the more uh, damage and the more uh, we do not restrict emissions, which means we don't focus on mitigation, our adaptation window is closing. This is a reality. So there will not be much room to adapt. So to adapt. So we definitely need to speed up adaptation and we definitely should not have to choose. One helps the other. It's not this versus that. Adaptation happens at the local level. The communities develop solutions to survive and uh, mitigation happens at a more global level. So this is what happens at the COPs where people go, you have um, the uh, intergovernmental panels, you have people from all over around the world committing, you know, that we will uh, phase out uh, coal or we will phase out the fossil fuels, we will invest in, uh, you know, in renewables or uh, whatever it is, or uh, we will invest on nature, or whatever. So the, these two, I, I don't think we should get lost in the uh, which one. We have to do both, and we have to do them very, very intensely. And as a local community, how much control do you have? What happens, say, the U.S. government if they want to uh, limit emissions, or you know? So this gives an opportunity to the local communities to actually uh, do something and and take action. To, to adapt because you need to survive. And then we, we as active citizens, we need to go through our governments and we need to, uh, you know, to, to take initiative and create the critical mass of pressure to our leaders because our uh, politicians actually follow what we, uh, the voters, uh, ask for. And we should push uh, for also mitigation, but we should not have to choose. Thank you. I think Joanna also want to speak. Laia, would you? Yeah, I I understand that we talk about adaptation and mitigation, but it's two different things. Mitigation is absolutely compulsory. Like it's in it's indispensable. There's nothing <laughs> adaptation cannot even occur because we will not be able to adapt uh, at this rate anyway. Um, and adaptation is very important because it's it's not only because of uh, we are in the face of climate change and and these extreme events are happening and are affecting our local communities as, as we are saying. It is also because um, the fact that climate change is happening, it is also a wake up call in the way that we do things as humans, and so it is. At a local level, we, I, in my opinion, I know, we need to embrace adaptation in order to change that. So, yeah, it's a different concept. Yeah, uh, well, I think this is a very ideological discussion that we always have when we counter uh, uh, talk about mitigation and adaptation. And of course, they go together. But we know that certain voices, and maybe this question comes from these voices, um, well, claim that um, when we invest in adaptation, um, we are um, actually denying, cli denying climate and just taking for granted that that's what it is and we just need to adapt and that's it. So I totally agree, to, agree with what Chrissy and Laia said. Uh, and what I would add is mitigation as a way of changing society, changing the economic system, et cetera, is a very ideological process. Uh, it always ends up with words. We know that uh, we know how to figure out um, specific immediate solutions, innovative solutions for adaptation. And I think those are necessary to trigger mitigation. And I will only give an example. Um, to see how, how mitigation requires an ideological move, um, following up on what I was sh uh, talking about, uh, sharing a, a body of knowledge and sharing certain values and ideas. In Barcelona, uh, there was recently this um, uh, policy of um, 
well, taking cars out of the street and getting rid of cars and opening streets to, to citizens. And um, this can be seen as a measure, uh, a local measure that combines mitigation and adaptation, uh, adaptation because you either get rid of CO2 or the most vulnerable um, groups really suffer the consequences of, of um, air quality. And mitigation because it's a way of, um, well, reducing the use of cars in the city. Well, suddenly um, there was a lot of um, uh, opposition from citizens to this uh, measure, but once they've experienced this uh, uh, the, the life quality that uh, it means to be able to get out of your house and walk the streets and breathe the air and then move to another street and get your car, well, the, the adaptation measure will lead eventually to um, ideologies that support mitigation because mitigation um, entails, uh, let's be frank, um, sometimes serious ideological uh, changes, uh, like getting rid of cars, <laughs> to name one. So um, once the next government uh, has arrived and has said, okay, um, I'm gonna, change this policy and get cars back to the streets, citizens that were at the beginning not so happy suddenly say, well, 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 well wait, maybe it wasn't that bad an idea. And maybe we've actually been um, experiencing another type of city. And maybe I'm ready to change a little bit the way I see the use of the car. And so we do need to work both strategies together but we also need to build on this idea of sharing values and sharing a way of seeing how things need to move on well. Thank you so much. Um, so we have Jan and Leon, and I think after these we'll have to close and move to our next panel. Jan, do you want to? Yes, uh, well, I'm, I'm basically saying the same, uh, what has been said before, uh, like adaptation, uh, like something that, that people thought to avoid, uh, say, oh, we will work on mitigation and everything is solved, but it doesn't go fast and we don't move <laughs> at the speed that is needed, so adaptation comes in and becoming important, uh, but... but um, but if you talk about it at local level, right, then, then, then basically you have to do it together. If you come up with like pathways, like how can our community become better, then, then it's be better that you discuss both like energy and, and, and disaster functions and nature restoration, because it's all a bit... Sometimes people don't see basically the difference. Eh? Working on climate is working on climate, eh? and then mitigation and adaptation are difficult terms for many people. Um, so that is basically the message I, I want to give, like, like just work with your local regional level, sometimes also in countries, uh, on both things together, because if you have two units, one working on energy, the other on adaptation, then of course they do stuff that is not compatible. So, yeah, make like Thank an you. integrated plan. Thank you. Uh, Leon, do you have something to say? And I, I, I yeah. think we have someone in the audience. Yeah. I'll, uh, I think um, it's important to, I think we're uh, asking the wrong question here. We're missing the systems thinking. We need to see things as a nexus. So behind this, we have the water, energy, food, ecosystems nexus. And that's important to understand how local decisions are made. Something that is right for Northern Europe might be wrong for the South of Europe. For instance, uh, I'm thinking clean energy production, fantastic. Uh, uh, through hydropower, but you can increase flood risk. So on the one hand, you have mitigation. On the other hand, adaptation, you cannot co-optimize this. Uh, you might have production of biofuels. They're very water intensive. That means you destroy the ecosystem uh, nearby. So always think of the nexus. Always think also of uh, local uh, resilience definitions. Uh, I think that's something that we need to uh, bring here and uh, policies won't work in a pan-European level, not even in a national level. It will work. They will work in a catchment level, maybe. So uh, local communities need to decide for themselves. And we can think of other multiple examples: photovoltaics being installed, uh, wind turbines, 
they're, they're not the solution to everything. They're not a problem for everything. It's very mm -hmm. context specific. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. Well, uh, I, I found very inspiring uh, all the, the projects and uh, everything that was said here. But this brought me to think about this question about holistic and systemic. That is what we want. And to do that, uh, and I really <laughs> appreciated very much what Kirsten said about that, the question about multi-level governance. Without having this connection, then we have some problems. And uh, on the other side, the partnership approach and how to put really uh, all the actors uh, to work together. And we are speaking about this when we need leadership from the local authorities and the local authorities are organized exactly on the opposite of that. They work top down, they work by silos and they are hierarchical. And we are asking them exactly to do the opposite. So my question is because in all these projects and that I find really remarkable, but to be able to come to the solutions, because normally when projects are funded, it's expected that the solutions come like this. But what is forgotten very often, and I have worked in, in all my years of age <laughs> in many projects, what is expected is that without thinking that you need to work very much on this concept of partnership, on new ways of working, of working with all the actors and creating really this partnership approach because you need trust, you need time, you need resilience. And to do this, you really need a hard work. And this is not funded. Normally, this is not funded. So how can you cope with this? Thank you. This, this question is music to my ears because within, within SDSN, I lead the networks program. And it's very hard for donors and for those who have the, the funds to understand that the network itself needs to be funded, exactly. that it's an infrastructure of sorts. Exactly. So I could not understand, I agree more. I think the, the, the uh, do you want to say or a few just, uh, just And okay. this uh, connects very well to with our next panel. Next so panel. just- Okay, very, very what? short. I, I want to say that uh, obviously you, I think you have touched at the heart of the problem. It's not the technologies that limit us. It is the political process. So we we are hopeful that we will allow enough time, uh, at, you know, maybe at the last year of the project to focus on that because you need to understand why the mayor acts the way he acts, who advises him, what uh, what what is what are the interests there that are being served, and you need to interject there. And how do you do it? I mean, we are thinking to change things, lobbying, uh, raising it in the political agenda. Uh, if you portray a problem like it's something for the environment, people may not care, maybe law politics, you want to bring it up, you need to uh, publicize it, maybe have the media on your side. So you need to touch and then uh, find the, the timing, the correct timing, because as I said, most of the mayors and uh, you know these uh, governors uh, work for four years because the election period is that. So you need to find inspired leaders and we we try we will try to focus on understanding the political process which is at the heart of uh, uh, bringing transformative change yeah I'm, I'm not saying we will achieve it but this is our ultimate ambition That's great Laya I want to say a very very brief thing because it's it's very important from the scientific side the question applies equally a hundred percent because events are not isolated events create a reaction a chain reaction many times. So um, cascading effects, compound events, like the social economic hazard, the connection between these events and what they cause is very important. And it's not so um, figured out yet from a scientific perspective. So yeah, just want to say that it applies to every level of discussion in the topic. 
Thank you very much. All right, so let's thank you everyone for joining us uh, and staying with us. Uh, Jan, Leon, thank you for joining us online. We continue with our next panel that will be focusing on the unit of cities. And I want to welcome Julio Lumbreras, Oscar Molina, Kirsten Dunlop, and uh, John Thwaites. Hi, good morning, everybody. Well, thank you for joining this session, both the people here in person and also the around 50 people online, or no more, now 84. So have lots of people online, thanks to these new technologies. And I assume today we expected more people in person, but rain <laughs> has uh, challenged everything and it's a messy week and, and day, but we are so happy having you here. And now we are moving from, from one uh, perspective now to thinking on how systems thinking can really transform cities and how important this is, right? So I'll do a very brief introduction and then I'll give the floor to my uh, colleagues uh, who will talk in detail about the different levels and actors that can play a role in transforming cities. So I think we all agree that we need a systemic thinking or a systemic approach to transform any city, right? Because a city in the end of the day is a system of systems. So we have all the services that a city provides. So we have transportation, we have energy in many different kinds. We have health, we have education. And if you think about all these services or all these goods that we have in a city, even food, anyone is, is a system, right? If we think about education, we are here, for example, in the university. And to be here, we, we have a system behind this, right? And a system that it's connected with other systems. So we are here thanks to also the energy system because we have electricity here, have some coffee thanks to SDSN, but also thanks to the uh, food system, right? We go to the restaurants and we have water and so on and so forth, right? So every service we are enjoying in a city is thanks to this system of systems. And when we think about the city, as we were talking before, we cannot just think about the local environment, right? But we need to think about the metropolitan area and the region. We won't have any electricity without the power plant that is probably 50 miles from here, or we won't have water without the dam that it's elsewhere, right? So, so it's impossible to think of a city as a very constrained uh, space in, uh, in, in a place, right? So having this in mind, I think it's clear that we need this system thinking to transform any city. But as we were also talking before, it's so easy to say that, but so hard to make this happen and so hard to really implement and think differently and do new ways and fun, as you were saying before, these new ways of working. And now today, hopefully will be inspiring and energizing to you because we have some examples of how this is actually happening and how these things are really changing and transforming our cities. So I think we'll hopefully after this session, we'll go energized and, and thinking, okay, that's possible. It's not only important and it's not only nice and, and, and interesting, but it's possible. And we, we only need to replicate, to scale up, to do it in many other places around the globe. And, and I'm finishing with this, even more knowing that we are now today or almost today at the midpoint of the agenda 2030 right so we only have seven years ahead and we need to change at a scale and at a pace that's un that's unprecedented and we cannot make this without cities and without the systems thinking so we need these ex examples and and we need to to extrapolate and to work across the globe in a different way having said that I'm so thankful for your participation because we have an incredible panel today. 
So you probably know all these three amazing colleagues that are here with me, but I'll briefly introduce uh, each of them and I'll give the floor to, to each of them. So first, Kirsten Dunlop, thank you so much, Kirsten, is the CEO of Climate Kick, you know, is the largest innovation initiative uh, around climate change in Europe, who's doing an amazing job. And I'll give you the floor, Kirsten, to start talking about how this is important at the city level, the system's thinking, and what's, what are you doing in Europe to make this happen? Thank you. Thank you very much, Julio. Um, I'm going to test out our capacity to put some slides up and see how that goes. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, and just see how this... It would be pointing here or here. Ah, perfect. Um, okay, so... Let me just introduce, there are many, many things happening in the European context with respect to large-scale transformation and the 2030 agenda. But this particular initiative I wanted to pull into this panel because of the degree to which it is driving extremely dramatically different, or at least seeking to drive dramatically different scale, pace, penetration, and structural order of change. It is explicitly con uh, framed up as the notion of a mission. Europe has borrowed um, a leaf out of the book of Kennedy and launched uh, the notion of something that is designed to create a leap forward well beyond what we currently consider to be possible. And it is very clear that what we are leaping for here is not currently possible in the managed stage transition that most countries and most regions and cities are planning for. This is a mission to mobilize hearts, minds and markets and to do so above all through the notion of really mobilizing a learning mechanism for a constant iterative uh, peer support, cohort learning, and experimentation and demonstration of what's possible. So explicitly what this means, Europe has launched five missions. One of these is focused on more than 100 cities, 100 in Europe and 12 on the edges of Europe, committing to decarbonize by 2030. No offsets, actual decarbonization. This is scope one and two. But obviously, for cities, that makes it very difficult not to start drawing in scope three. It represents 18% of Europe's population, and it represents, in terms of emissions avoided just on scope one and two, 0.7 gigatons of emissions avoided by 2040, if and as we can pull this off. So it's a, not a small deal. Once you start really adding, adding in a lot of the, the then co-benefits and collateral effects, it starts to get extremely important. It clearly exposes immediately, and this is one of the things we already see one year in, the key areas of absolutely essential nexus systemic change necessities between the built environment and everything that has to do with construction, materials, planning, incentives, taxes, permitting, and so on. The differences in laws, why is it possible for, for uh, a legislative framework to determine exactly how streets are to be structured or laid and the energy system to be laid out in relationship to it, but freedom given to developers on determining materials and energy efficiency of buildings or how that might be achieved. So cities are already arriving at a point of saying, we may need to really look at how some of the coherency of these frameworks and permits are arranged. It clearly exposes the critical element of energy systems, not just the provision of renewable energy sources, but the infrastructure, the design, decentralized distributed grid mechanisms. How do you genuinely create energy communities quickly enough to shift mindsets of residents and communities on the possibility of what this means? It absolutely throws up immediately financial mechanisms. Most people do not have 70,000 euro to retrofit their homes. So that means something shifts in terms of who receives a loan, not the home resident, but the home, the building structure, long-term slow release structures that start to shift the way in which we think about ownership and benefit and the securitizing of future value. It starts to shift massively the evidence around plastic waste in the system, dealing with last mile, all of the things where when you really work back 
from an actual physical place and say, by 2030, this has got to be different. You are finally dealing fully with almost every element of the system. Now, this program is extremely bold. It's extremely complex and complicated. It involves cities working in cohorts, learning from each other, focusing on areas where they know they've already got strengths to build on and where they can start to look at how they give each other courage to go further and faster. It's looking at how they can actively demonstrate and create precedent for others to follow because so much of this is about directional signal and about to markets and to finance and to investors, small businesses, big businesses, to try and look at how to bring in the layers of intervention it's explicitly designed to bring in multiple elements. The TCs formally produce a climate, a full systems mapping of their current full, uh, uh, emissions and baseline. They draw up action plans to look at what would be possible, what would it take to get to decarbonization by 2030. They draw up investment plans with a full economic modeling, looking at the business case for costs, benefit, possible return. They look at governance innovation because much of this indeed comes down to multi-level governance and the significant shifts it takes in city governments and in city, regional, national, and pan-European governance to make this possible. And all of that rolls up into a climate city contract, which is a formal commitment to actually make this possible, and then a label that then signals to the financial system, this is seriously happening. And it is a very interesting shift when you start to get into the conversations with financial institutions, both public and private, and with industry on the extent to which this is real, because it's very different. And it creates a very, very different dynamic. If you think about the supply that these cities require in terms of green materials, logistics, supply chain, it's a totally different market. But all of a sudden, it's sitting within a set of nested regulations that makes it possible to start thinking in terms of that scale of market building. This is just a, a, to give you a sense of how this system works on continuously iterating around the idea that this is about a learning mechanism using a portfolio logic. So the construct here is that the city, the place constitutes a field of portfolio building, whereby many hundreds of individual projects and innovation positions and actions can be positioned and connected with one another so that you can actually look at the interrelations between, this is the impact framework and the monitoring evaluation framework, so that you're actually looking all the way along at the interrelations between energy, food waste, physical systems, the possibility of rewilding, how the structures of planning and resourcing and urban planning are working. And you can then begin to really look at an iterative process of trying different relationships, looking for the potential combinations and synergies where multiple dimensions of solutions can start to create more holistic, multi-sided um, outcomes. And then you are really beginning to work the many present levers for transformation in one place. I know when we describe this, because it's my daily job to go out and describe to those who are not involved, this is what's actually happening. I get a lean back in the chair and uh, you're not serious. This is not actually possible, nor is it in fact something that I representing a company or a bank or an insurer would even know how to engage in. And that indeed is the point. This is a programming logic, a platform. It is supported by a platform made up of many partners working actively together. It digs into years of innovation ecosystem building across Europe at multiple scales, and it is precisely designed to learn how to do this in such a way at a sufficient critical mass that other cities, hundreds of other cities can follow as quickly as possible. And one of the things that we are delighted to be doing this week is to be discussing with the US state of California and a number of other cities in, U in the US to explore what might be possible in similar terms in the US, building instead in the US much more from the notion of equitable communities and circularity and circular economy. So it's an exciting proposition. It really leans into dynamic principles of activation, dynamic principles of learning by doing, and of portfolio construction and management. No, both. I think I also need that. No, no. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Well, after listening to you, it's hard to say anything else because it's amazing and thank you for your leadership as an organization on this endeavor because this mission the platform is an 
a consortium of 33 organizations that uh, is led by Climate Kick. So thank you for that. And as you were saying, when you listen to that, you are like, wow, is this possible? <laughs> and cities, these 112 cities are facing lots of problems, right? And lots of barriers and challenges in this process. And some of these challenges are similar in a specific context, similar in a region or in a member state in the case of Europe, in a country, right? And that's why the European Commission and the mission asked to create not only the European platform, but also national platforms where cities can work together at the national level, overcoming these barriers altogether, overcoming the cultural barriers, the fiscal barriers, the economic barriers, and all technological barriers in some cases, and so on and so forth, right? And that's what I'm talking because they ask me to moderate as well as present, and I'll be very short before giving the floor to Oscar. So, so now I'll, do you have the slide deck? If not, no worries, I can, okay. So what I'm now, it's going a bit scaled down and I'll go to the just one. Gotta say next, because it's online. So yeah, next, uh, go to the, because I'll go directly to the last one. So move because I don't want to spend, Kirsten already explained the context and why this mission is important. So go ahead, these are the other missions. And I only want to go to one slide at the end. Please go ahead, more, 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 a bit one, this one, there you go. So now, I'll only stay in this slide for the five minutes. So, so the point now is, okay, so we created in the European Union this mission. There is 112 cities now, but there is two main challenges, right? How can we in reality work on this in each city? And they are facing all these barriers. And also the last thing that Kirsten said. So how can we use this as a first step? How can we use these cities as front runners? How can we really engage the other cities that are across Europe, right? And the answer to that is we need to, on top of the work at the European level, we need to create national platforms. We need to create a safe space at the national or regional level to promote and foster this work, right? to promote this radical collaboration between different stakeholders, to really think systemically, to really implement the climate city contracts and everything that Kirsten mentioned before, right? And that's very hard because nobody wants to fund this, right? That's why your comment before was so important to me, right? Because it's hard to, to, to fund this, but it's extremely relevant. And what we are doing, and that's the case, the example of Spain, but there is also another platform in Sweden that was, by the way, inspiring for us because they launched this platform six, seven years ago. And there is other countries working on this. There is France, Slovenia, Germany, Italy, Greece, Ireland, and other countries across Europe working on this. So the idea is we need to create this infrastructure, this safe space, where everybody can collaborate, right? And that's what we call national platform. And a national platform is not an online web place where you go and see documents. We also have, of course, a web, but that's not the point. The point is creating this place where people can work together, where private companies can work with cities, with civil servants, can work with the NGOs, with uh, civil organizations, can work with universities and research centers, together towards transforming the city in this complex system of systems we were talking before, right? And what we are doing in this platform, thanks to the funds from the national government and also to the work, because this platform is run by Climate Kick and I'm from the Technical University of Madrid, we are running the platform together. We are creating this space mainly with three different types of services. We are offering people who are in the space three different services. And there, here you can see which are they. They are not 
lineal. So they are not like levels that you have to go to the first and then to the second. So we are offering the three levels simultaneously. And we are mainly working on overcoming the barriers I mentioned before, right? The first, the main barrier is the silos that we are experiencing in cities, right? There is silos across departments, there is silos across sectors, there is silos across stakeholders, there is silos across governance, right? So we need to break down these silos. So, and to break down the silos, the first service is to really promote a real collaboration between the stakeholders. So what we offer is meeting points or meeting events, right? We organize online events every month. We have a climate breakfast. We have in-person sessions. We have a summer course where Kristen was one month ago with 150 people from private companies, academia, uh, cities working together for two and a half days. So we have, we organize events where people can learn from each other, can connect, can do networking and can really start creating the bonds that are necessary to make this happen because the main element, the main ingredient for the success of this platform is trust. We need to build trust and connections between people. So that's the focus of this first level of services. But then as Kirsten said, cities need to develop these climate city contracts, need to have a climate action plan to become climate neutral, which is extremely hard, right? And they need also to find funds. They need to develop an economic case. They need to develop a financial um, case for this uh, for this climate city for the for the action plan. And that's what we call the climate city contract. And in the platform, what we do is we work with the cities and other stakeholders to develop these climate city contracts. We have an economic model where we estimate emissions for the future, the actions that should be taken and the costs, the investments that are necessary and the benefits associated to these investments. And we support the cities in creating the investment plan to make this happen, knowing that the, the need for investment is huge. We need around 10,000 euros per person, per inhabitant. So for example, a city like Madrid, 3.5 million, would need 35 billion euros to transform from now till 2030. And this money doesn't need to come from the city, from the budget, city budget, it needs to come from all the stakeholders that need to invest in transforming the city, right? So how you make this happen is what we work with the cities on the training piece. We create capacities, we change minds, we work with them, with the cities in creating these climate city contracts and in developing what they need to transform the cities. And finally, what is the most valuable thing from my perspective in this platform, both at the European level and at the national level, is the power of the width. We are used to see cities competing with each other, right? Because they, they compete for talent, they compete for money, they compete for different kinds of resources. But what we are realizing is that when they work together and when they collaborate, they go further and faster. And they are experiencing this. And the third level of service is the cities are working together in what we call multi-city programs. So they put a challenge and they start working together. The first program we are launching is a program to retrofit 1 million buildings in the seven Spanish cities that are part of the mission which means multiplying by 10 the speed for retrofitting in these cities. And why it's amazing, because they are experiencing that when they work together and they are from very different political parties, so very the political diversity is great, the size is different, so they are very diverse. But when they work together, they gain scale, they easily more easily attract private funding, they can change the laws, the regulation at the national level because they have the power to negotiate with the national government and they can develop new methodologies and new instruments that they can use together. Because when they go to the intervention at the city level, you know, this civil servant that is always saying, no, 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 you cannot do that, you cannot do that. If this civil servant uh, faces a new instrument that it's approved and it's being done by different cities across the same country, they kind of say no, right? 
So it's a different way of changing the system, working together with the other cities in a region or in a country, right? So as Kirsten was saying, the only way we are experiencing to transform cities is doing or applying this portfolio approach. And when we talk about portfolio, we talk about different projects touching up on different levels of change using different instruments, financial instruments, regulatory instruments, and so on, but working together. And to work together, the only way we see is creating these platforms. And that's the example that we are using in Spain. And I think it's hopefully inspiring for you. And having said that, uh, now I give the floor to our next, next speaker. Let me say the chart correctly. So Oscar Molina, he's the pro-rector or provost of Universidad Privada Bolivariana. Who's, Boliviana. Which is one, uh, Boliviana, sorry, sorry, Boliviana from Bolivia, <laughs> who's the, the one of the most relevant universities in Bolivia. And he'll talk about the case of La Paz, which is the city of Bolivia. Thank you so much, Oscar. Thank you. <clears throat> No, it's okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, first, thank you for the invitation to to Maria and Giovanni. It's a real pleasure to to share this this floor with uh, with Julio, Christian, and and John. Of course, uh, I think the most important thing is the context. You you said about the context. Of, of course, the context is very different between, of, of course, the cities in Europe, uh, North America, and Latin America. I think in this in this session, I am the only person of Latin America. I don't, I'm not sure. Yes, the only person of Latin America. Okay. Uh, oh, perfect. Let me start this uh, this presentation uh, by introducing the new symbol of uh, SDSN Bolivia, the SDSN crane, la grulla in español. This crane uh, for us represents the positive challenge. <clears throat> Let me change this. And represent the hope and uh, positive change in, in Bolivia. Of course, uh, I'm sure some quick facts about my country. I'm sure not all of you know much about Bolivia. But for example, in terms of, in terms of size, uh, we are a large country, more than 1 million square kilometers, more than France and Spain together. But we only have 12 million people, similar to Belgium, for example. In terms of GDP, we have more than $9,000 in PPP, party purchasing power. And our, we are a, a medium income country. But in the recent months, I have been deeply concerned about the state of my country. In uh, our history, Bolivia has attempted to develop by exploiting natural resources, starting by minerals two centuries ago, and more recently, uh, hydrocarbons, specifically natural gas. And it's not a secret that no country in the world has achieved robust development solely by spotting natural resources. In the short term, in the short term, let me say you, it's practically impossible to make to necessary to investment and exploiting the reverse of this situation. At this moment, at this moment, for example, the a few years, in the last few years, Bolivia's natural gas reserves have uh, decreased and the fluctuations of the commodity prices have resulted in the trade and fiscal several and great problems in, in my country. I really believe that the solution in the short term is change the, uh, the strategic sector in my country of course, it's not at mining minerals of uh, hydrocarbons. I think it is possible to change to this sector, this uh, tourism. I think it's a real, real offer 
a real a solution to the sustainable development alternative for Bolivia. Many other countries uh, have sustainable stories uh, about related to the tourism, for example, Mexico and, and Costa Rica. For example, the share, the average share of the participation in tourism on GDP from uh, uh, 2008 to 2022 in Bolivia is 1.8% for this GDP. In from Mexico, this same indicator is 8.6% from his GDP, for their GDP. Today, we have been working in two important papers. Uh, the first is tourism as a key of driver of sustainable development, the case of Bolivia. In this paper, we explore the idea that tourism is a critical driver of development. We uh, use a solo uh, model to measure growth and examine the factors influencing tourism. Our results suggest that tourism physical capital accumulation, human capital accumulation, and the corresponding depreciation rates influence in the steady state output level per worker. And in the second paper, this uh, Dutch disease in the department of Tarija is tourism the alternative. This paper demonstrates that the tourism sector is the least affected by economic sector by the natural gas Dutch disease. As a result, we propose a development model centered around tourism. And uh, after these two papers, and after this result of the Orbita and SDCN projects, I really believe that tourism holds the key to Bolivia development, particularly in addressing the short-term trade deficit issues. I look forward to sharing this paper with you soon. Now let me refocus on the main point of this session. The, the first work of the SDSM Bolivia was the Municipal Atlas of Sustainable Development Goals in Bolivia 2020. This atlas provides information for all municipalities in Bolivia. At this moment, we have 339 municipalities, a huge, and this atlas shows their progress uh, towards the SDGs. The atlas results suggest that tourism is the most important option for Bolivia and all three groups, economy, society, and biosphere. For example, one indicator of the atlas uh, is the Municipal Index of Sustainable Development, EMDS. La Paz, for example, La Paz. La Paz is the administrative city of Bolivia. It's not the capital. The capital of Bolivia is Sucre. A uh, small city in Bolivia received the highest score with uh, eight zero point two points, bigger than Bolivia average. The Bolivia average, this indicator is six one point seven. But the interesting thing is this score from La Paz is like the score of Scandinavian countries, for example, in the Global SDGs Index. Based on these results of the SDGs Atlas, uh, we have decided to promote tourism as a key of the sustainable development in Bolivia. For example, we have uh, created Orbita. This, this project, Orbita, is the first Bolivian observatory for sustainable tourism. We launched a competition of sustainable tourism solutions in Bolivia, and we calculate the, the first municipal index of tourism potential in Bolivia. In the Orbita project, uh, we finance the research of 25 student theses related to tourism, gender, and sustainable development. And we publish uh, monthly tourism intelligence bulletins. Additionally, we provide business advisory services for uh, more than 50 women-led tourism enterprises in my country. These bulletins uh, are very interesting because provides easy information for a tourist commu uh, community. For example, some uh, highlights that tourism is particularly beneficial for gender equality. It's interesting. For example, at this moment, look this this graph. In the in the last the last uh, century, all the all business related to to tourism was led by by men. But at this moment, it's it's led by by women. It's very interesting. One uh, 
critical variable is the investments. For example, La Paz is the municipality that invests most in tourism, but less than half a million dollars per year. $500,000. But with that modest investment, a municipal tourism GDP is more than $3 million in only $300 million, only in La Paz. Tourism, my friends, my colleagues, is not a priority for the public sector. Without a plan, like in other countries, tourism generates more money that, and revenues than other sectors that receive much investments. It is crucial that the public sector consider tourism as a strategic sector for Bolivia, and the politicians see the potential of these sectors. Only, only as a data, La Paz receives 3,000 tourists in one year, 3,000, 100 tourists in one year. Do you know how many receives in Mexico? Mexico receives more than 30, than 31 million tourists in one year. All Bolivia receives 1.2 million tourists in one year. Only Cusco in Peru, only Cusco and Peru receives more than 1.5 million tourists in one year. In the Spanish, we say, para muestra un botón. I may look at uh, a, a good translation for this in English. I think proof is in the pudding. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's very, very interesting translation from the very space in Spanish. Next month, next month, we will officially launch the Bolivian, the Bolivia's municipality index in tourism potential and uh, publish many academic and non-academic papers to support this idea in my country. This uh, municipal index of tourism potential use the same methodology as the SDG, SDG index, but uh, with a specific indicator relevant to developing the tourism sector. It is divided in uh, four main topics and uh, 42 variables. Okay, this is the four topics, of course, I finish. This is the map of all municipalities uh, in Bolivia, while La Paz also heads this index. This, this is significant tourism potential for all parts of Bolivia, if you can see. Let me go fast, I go fast. Uh, it's very interesting, for example, uh, with only 300,000 tourists, La Paz won the recognition as one of the seven new urban wonders involved in, in the world in 2015. And 2022 and 2023, he was also won as the most biodiverse city in Earth in the Global Natural City Challenge. For example, one methodological uh, innovation uh, in the Atlas and in this index is using the cartograms. These cartograms is very interesting because show the municipalities in terms of the population, and we can see the reality best than only see the, the maps. Uh, the state capitals of Bolivia, this is the, in the middle of the, of the of the country, the most people have high tourism potential. A part of this, a few municipalities at Tanam, the city of La Paz, for example, El Alto is, is very, very, very interesting city. And this is probably the biggest surprise in this in these results. To finish, look that, uh, considering the 42 sub-indicators included in the municipal index of tourism potential, uh, this slide show the 10 top ranking municipalities. Uh, all the state capitals are in the top, except Coroico, Paradise Tropical Forest, Uyuni, the salt flats. I don't know, you know, the salt flats in Bolivia, and Copacabana, and Titicaca Lake. Of course, we invite you all to, to visit my, my country. And uh, I don't have more time, but thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julio. Julio. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oscar. Very interesting. <laughs> So we we moved from from the general idea of systems thinking at the city level. Then we moved to Europe to the example of Europe. Now, after that, to the national platforms and how cities can work at the regional or national level. And now we went in a very detailed case to one city and working in particular on tourism. 
and thank you, Oscar. And now we'll finish our panel with with John Twitz. I don't know if I said it correctly, always <laughs> challenging Twitz or, okay, yeah. <laughs> You probably all know John because he's uh, very famous. It's hard to to introduce him, but just said that, that he's a professional fellow at Monash University in Australia, and also chair of the Monash Sustainable Development Institute and Climate Works Center there. Thank you so much, John. And now he will bring us back to more uh, vision on what's the role of the higher education sector of universities in transforming cities using this systemic thinking approach. Thank you, John. Thank you for joining. Well, thank you very much, Julio. And Twaits is a hard word to say in Spanish, and it's even harder in Portuguese, apparently. But, uh, look, it's great to be here today and to talk about the role of higher education for thinking uh, systemically to transform cities. I'm, I'm going to start, though, by my previous role, which was uh, as a government minister. And 20 years ago, I was actually minister for planning for Victoria and responsible for the plan for Melbourne, which was a 25 year plan aimed to see Melbourne as a system of systems, as you talked about, to connect the transport, the housing, the energy, the environment, the emissions and the economy with outcomes that were very consistent with the sustainable development goals and it was a good plan but five years later uh, there was an audit of the plan and it found that the plan was very worthy but implementation fell short which is pretty typical uh, in government and there were three essential reasons for that the first was the lack of clarity of responsibility who had overall responsibility for implementing the plan? The second was the need for adequate resources, funding and financing. And the third was the need for broad-based support for the plan, particularly from local government that had to implement it. And the essential problem was governance. It was a nice plan, but it didn't have sufficient buy-in and involvement from key parts of the system, from the finance minister to provide the money, from transport that had the clout, from business with the jobs and local government who had to implement it. And I take these lessons to my approach to how higher education needs to look at systemic thinking in city transformation. It's not enough to have great analysis of the systems. It's really all about the implementation. And that's why I was very interested in Kirsten's discussion earlier about the cities, about multi-level governance and climate city contracts. Because I think there are two specific governance techniques that can actually assist with implementation. And I might say I'm also the chair of Melbourne's water utility, and I've been trying to get contracts with local government for that very reason, because you need something so that all the parties don't just talk about a nice plan, they're actually signed up to do something about it. Well, what about higher education? Higher education certainly has a very important role to play in transforming cities. And on the right, I've set out some of the positives about higher education. First, higher education provides the knowledge, the evidence, the innovation, the technologies that we need if we're going to transform cities. Second, we train the implementers. We train the planners and the engineers and the social scientists who are going to transform cities. Third, universities have the potential to show cross-sectoral leadership because they're not just part of business or just part of the social sector. They can go across the whole of sectors and show leadership to guide the transformation. Fourth, and I actually think this is probably the biggest thing we can do, is experimentation. Uh, universities are good. Researchers are good at experimentation, probably better at that than they are at implementation. And if we're going to get the sort of innovations to have the 
big step forwards that Kirsten talks about, in many cases, it's going to be underpinned by research on the ground. And finally, I think uh, universities have a level of independence that allows them to try risky things that business or governments won't do. But, and there's always a but, <laughs> traditional academic structures in universities, which are discipline-based and faculties of engineering and science and the arts, are not conducive to, to systems thinking. In fact, they reinforce silo thinking. And I would argue that we need completely new approaches in higher education to support systems approaches to transform cities. In fact, universities have to transform themselves. The good news is this, this is starting and we're seeing universities move from traditional discipline-based academic structures based around single disciplines to a transdisciplinary approach, which incorporates not only multiple disciplines, but also incorporates decision-making with the community and practitioners. Second, and I think this is a really interesting one, is that within universities themselves, we need to see a much greater collaboration between the traditional research and education components and the operations arm of the university. Now, the operations arm used to be thought of something, oh, that happens out the back, completely separate from the main part of university, which was about research and education. But universities are very big businesses themselves with lots of emissions, lots of impact on their local communities, and we need to connect the operations with the research and education. The third, universities clearly need to be at the forefront of the commitment to net zero. And that means strong and ambitious net zero commitments that can be implemented in the shortest possible time frame. And fourth, going back to that point about experimentation, universities can be great places to experiment in place-based ways, as Kirsten said, because we are ourselves part of a local community and often part of precincts involving community and industry. And I'll talk a bit about Monash in its precinct, the university that I'm at. Now, just to help universities at uh, Monash and Climate Works and SDSN, we have collaborated on a guide, a net zero on campus guide, and this is to help universities in their operations become net zero. And we started off thinking, well, this is just about operations. It's, we don't wanna get into the research. We don't wanna get into the education. Let's just focus on that. But as we produced that guide, we saw of course that they're all connected and that there are huge opportunities for universities as they transform their operations to net zero to also use that as a testing ground for research and education. And this guide has 17 uh, initiatives across six action areas of, the, of uh, energy, waste and recycling, mobility, the value chain facilities, and importantly, the last one, beyond campus operations. Because once again, as we produced this guide and we did it with universities from all continents, we understood that it's not just about the university, it's about being able to use this as an exemplar for the precinct the university sits in and indeed broader uh, city-based transformations. And this has uh, at Monash been part of our commitment to be net zero by 2030. And that involves significant investment in renewable energy, in a smart grid, in energy efficiency, in transport. But it also has got us really thinking about where do we fit in our local precinct. And when you look at that precinct, uh, Monash is in a suburb of Melbourne. We sit in a precinct surrounded by industry and uh, residential development. The immediate precinct 
the the um, economic, the GDP of that is about nine billion dollars a year. I mean, it's, it's huge. We sit next to advanced uh, technology centres, to industry, and historically, they've really never talked to each other. And the university is a way to get this whole amazing precinct talking to each other and moving as a whole precinct to net zero. Potentially, as Julio talked about, sharing knowledge, sharing expertise, and you know, even sharing smart grids, for example. And we've set up a uh, net zero precinct research project, uh, which has multiple partners, including Engie, the French um, energy company, uh, multiple universities, the CSIRO, Australia's science organisation, ICLEI, representing um, local government, but also the local governments themselves. And what we're doing is working in, I think, the sort of way both Julio and Kirsten were talking about, talking not just about the emissions and the net zero, but looking also at the human aspects across the various systems. And we actually, you know, one of the researchers and a key part is anthropology, which wouldn't have been the discipline I would have, you know, first thought of, but actually is very relevant when it comes to talking to different groups uh, about the, envisaging a future. And so we're putting all of that together and hopefully that will lead to not only a vision for net zero, but most importantly, implementation, which is where I started the focus on implementation. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, John. So inspirational and relevant. And I suggest you to look at the guide. It's uh, really useful and, and, and relevant for the work at the higher education sector. So before coming here to the questions in the room, We'll have like five, 10 minutes. Okay, but so there is a couple of questions from from the uh, online people who just passed me. So let me, um, I'll read both and then I'll give you the floor, any of you who want to answer. So first is you talked about the US cities to follow the model of net zero cities in Europe. What's standing in the way? And the other one is how do you maintain the momentum and the interest of the cities in decarbonizing despite the election cycles. So, and other similar is how you can export the EU model to other regions, well, in particular the US, so it's similar to the first one. So, floor is yours. Maybe Kirsten, if you want to start. Yeah, so maybe how, how this can be extrapolated to other contexts. That's maybe the main and the generic question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think two things. So if I come at it from what's standing in the way and how this can be extrapolated, um, clearly what's stand so not nothing is clear. Let's let's be careful. Um, what stands in the way of achieving something like the European mission speaks very much to what each of us has been speaking to. First things first, the degree to which sponsorship is clear, responsibility and accountability are clear, and is sustained and sustainable through political cycles and at multiple levels. That is absolutely essential. And there is, in the European context, there is the overarching framework of the European Green Deal. There are a series of nested regulations from the Fit for 55 all the way through to different value chains, supply chains, the Climate Pact, uh, a full European climate risk assessment, which is now just being launched, and a number of elements that come together. However, if you look at this from the city perspective, from the regional perspective, and from the national perspective, there are still and or are remain very strongly in the same field of policy across the whole of Europe, a number of extreme inconsistencies and incoherencies in terms of how those different policies interact. So one of the principal obstacles is to work on coherence across. And the coherence is the incoherence is simply driven exactly as John was describing it by the fact that habitually most of the European policy units and, and director generals have done their thing 
aligned to the particular sectors and interests that they represent, whether it's ICT, information technology, or it's industrial strategy and a focus on what the internal logic of industrial growth and development needs to be, or it's the way in which education has been managed with a subsidiarity principle, so not necessarily responsible at the level of the whole of Europe, or it's the way in which we have thought about culture and creative arts as something completely different again, instead of harnessing it fully into the way in which we mobilize a different imagination for the future. So there are fundamental challenges between, say, the, the common agricultural policy, everything that's happening around food systems, the way in which critical more materials is driving a continuous focus on extractive growth, and the way in which, say, industrial policy necessarily supports the implementation of something that is sitting at a sub-national level. So there are challenges in how to overcome that. On the other hand, the, the success principle here is to start from a different logic, which is indeed place-based and which allows at that scale and in that context to see where those inconsistencies show up. Because if you can show it in practice, it's so much easier to then roll back up to what would effectively be a possibility for looking at more aligned regulation. And then there are other, the, probably the two other that I would pull out. Financial mobilization and financial architecture is incredibly difficult. The entire financial system, our assumptions about financing, again, is broken into a set of individual, individual sectored, segmented, and deliverables focused. Uh, assumptions. Things need to look like bankable assets before finance can imagine it gets there. And that's very, very hard when you are talking about the portfolio of a system or portfolio of systems of systems, as Julio was saying, at the level of a whole system, where waiting for the bankable assets is too slow because you're not flowing the funding in to build up the multi-sided business models that are scalable and that can replace our current system. Or the temptation, as we've seen it now, is you invest in the renewable solutions, but you're not investing in the infrastructure that makes it possible to scale those solutions across. And the third, and I, this very much strongly speaks to John's uh, observations, is mindset, capabilities, skills. Take Paris. Paris has 35,000, uh, sorry, 35 million roofs to be retrofit immediately. And there are 60,000 qualified roofers. And that kind of disproportionate number plays out over and over again. We simply don't have the professional skills. We don't have the leadership history, mindset, habits, practices of working in this kind of much more holistic and systemic way. And we don't even have the basic technical, practical skills to input a lot of the different technology changes. So there are multiple barriers, but let me just start with those. In terms of how it, this can be rolled out to other areas or how, how the precedent of what Europe is doing and this call to action can be adopted or mirrored in other areas. Many of the tools, the frameworks and the principles of tools and structuring are, are key. The precedent is important because demonstrating possibility really does start to open up. We live in a culture where seeing is believing, where the first question people ask you is, well, has it been done somewhere? Can you show me? And so being able to actually show this is happening, there is a degree of willingness to commit behind something this bold already changes the conversation. Then there is a suite of very well thought through, carefully structured, interrelated tools and mechanisms to engage the full system. And that's replicable. And indeed, the discussions that we are having with the, the state of California is looking at how, what can you borrow across from a lot of those mechanisms that have to do with framework governance tools, policy frameworks, financial mobilization plans, economic modeling, and so on. And I think the, the third element is probably what I would describe as the extraordinary capability piece this is about people learning to do something differently and acquiring a skill and a capability and a sense of possibility. And they are professionals. These contexts are growing multi-generational um, cohorts, if you like, of humans, individual professionals who are experiencing this and are doing this. So one of the things that we are looking at right now in the context of the, of the war in Ukraine is to open up the missions as a space where Ukrainians currently in diaspora in Europe are embedded into the mission to learn as quickly as possible what is happening so that they can acquire skills, experience, relationships, partnerships, assets, and the opportunities to then apply that as quickly as possible as Ukraine hopefully at some point begins to stabilize enough to do it. So some of this is about sheer human capability. 
Wow, food for thought. Thank, thank you so much. So, Oscar, do you, do you want to talk about how your examples and can be extrapolated and go across political cycles? Yes. Well, well, your reflection, uh, of course, the uh, once again the the, the context of uh, of Latin America is very different of the Europe uh, Latin America. I think the most important problem at this moment in many Latin American countries is this course of the natural resources. Okay. And we need to change that. We need to change that. We need that many countries uh, found your uh, real potential to, to, to grow, to, to real potential to, to create a way to development. At this moment, it's, it's very important. Uh, another thing that is very important. Another thing is the uh, the mindset, of course, but more the corruption. The, the corruption in Latin America is the real problem. With corruption, it's, it's impossible to create uh, a planification, a strategic, a strategic planification. And to reduce the corruption, to, to cut the corruption, we need to work in the education progress. Of course, not only in the universities, we, we need to work in the elemental education at this moment. The, the lack of uh, opportunities in Bolivia and Latin America is, of course, a problem. The, the situation in Latin America and in Bolivia is very different. I, I, I think at this moment, uh, Latin America countries, it's, it's here. And the, for example, Europe cities and Europe countries are there. And of course, we have to, to reduce this gap and in the short uh, run first uh, before to, to, to think in another, another plans. Only with this reflection, uh, I think it's very important. The university, the UPV, is is uh, is, is participating in this in this program of the campus net zero. It's very important, and it's very important to measure the situation. It's very important to to share with the young people, share with the universities. But remember, uh, one tree is not a forest. <laughs> we really need in the base of the pyramid to 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 work and uh, uh, real make challenges in in Latin American countries. Thank you, Oscar. John, you want to? Well, very quickly, uh, in terms of other universities around the world following what we're doing, you can simply go on the website and uh, register and become part of the community of practice. And that's what I'd strongly recommend. Thank you. So we are running out of time, but if there is burning short question, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and mostly uh, for uh, for those I, the words I heard from John. I think one the key point is right to what you are mentioned. We are struggling in different contexts about this systemic thinking because we at the university we don't know we simply don't know uh, how to teach it. So. We have, I'm from Nova University, this moment I'm serving as a pro-rector, so I feel this every day. I'm trying to uh, think in a model how to include sustainability, not as a set of PowerPoints at the last class of physics or mechanical engineering or medicine or law or whatever. So I think we universities, we need, like you present that, uh, a nice uh, guide for operations. I think you need to think on a nice guide for the professors because there are lots of them. They simply don't know what to do that because they are quite old. I mean, I I think a bit on European terms, maybe in Portugal in particular, the median age are not so low, uh, but maybe we can think on this type of guidance on to how to um, teach this system thinking to transform not only cities but indeed the world. Every every aspects of we need to 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 get out for for the new because I can do that in some uh, programs. But when I go to the economics and business, this is very difficult to introduce that because the mindset there is very old fashioned. So we need to move forward a bit. I think this will cost between commas a generation to do that. But uh, I think uh, this is one, a key a pillar that we need to, to go ahead. 
I don't know if you have any magic bullet in Monash how to do that. We can talk in the coffee break. Thank you very much. I, I wish. Uh, well, yeah, you've given me one idea. So SDSN has supported a series of guides. We had getting started with the SDGs. We had getting started with education for the SDGs. We've had getting started with net zero on campuses. Now, maybe we should look at something on systems thinking. Uh, it's something where, yes, there are lots of experts across universities in systems thinking, but really, I don't think it's something that you can teach normally in a didactic way. Uh, it's something that's much better learnt through experience, through case studies. At Monash, we've introduced a, something called the Monash um, Innovation Guarantee, where every, undergraduate students in groups go and work with NGOs or companies on a problem linked to the SDGs. And that is the way to learn about systems thinking because you're confronting a problem, a challenge. But I, I, I think it's a great point and I, I think it's something that we should look at, um, Maria, in terms of a future guide. Sorry. Can I just do a quick build? Oh, it's a small um, news flash with respect to what's happening this week. Um, one of the initiatives that is feeding into the UN process is a thing called 17 Rooms, which is being supported by the Rockefeller Foundation and Brookings Institute. And room four um, involved in that is the education um, discussion. It's basically working on what could be concretely proposed into the UN process to make it possible to get some really structural shifts. And literally yesterday was an entire discussion on if there's one thing we have to try and get through into the COP process, it is that ministries of education are required to start introducing systemic thinking, systemic practice across the board. But that won't happen unless ministries of economy and finance require the ministries of education to service completely different paradigmatic models on how we're going to get a transition to happen. So there's a, there is a hot topic being discussed on precisely this, which could be useful to flow through. Thank you so much. And I would add that, as you said, John, we need to transform our universities as well. If we maintain the siloed based structures and governance systems, we won't change things in the university. So we need to really transform our universities. Thank you so, so much, this amazing panel. We are running out of time, so we will don't have a 10 minute break, but you can grab a coffee while the next panel is organized. And then we we'll have a, the lunch in one hour, so you'll have time to, 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 to talk to each other. So now next panel, Gonzalo. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much uh, for being here in, in the in this last session of this very interesting, very interesting morning. My name is Gonzalo Fanjul. I am policy director at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health and a member of the SDSN network. And together with Fio Cruz uh, and with our colleagues, uh, with Maria and Giovanni, with our colleagues in the SDSN Secretariat, uh, we have prepared this um, uh, last uh, roundtable uh, with the formal title of addressing systemic risks to human and planetary health. So the whole idea of our conversation is to bring together a, a topics a related to the health of the persons and the health of the planet. And I know that in academic terms, planetary health is a, is a whole discipline in itself, but I think that uh, we took it from a, from a broader uh, perspective, from, from a more uh, general perspective here. And we are going to do this with four panelists that I think is uh, are a complete uh, luxury. Let me start here uh, with uh, uh, Ethel. Ethel Leonor uh, Noya Maciel. She is the Secretary for Vigilancia y Medio Ambiente, which is, uh, I believe, the translation could be uh, surveillance and environment uh, in the in the Ministry of Health in uh, in the Brazilian government. Then. Uh, Josh Carliner, uh, he's the director of global partnerships in healthcare without harm. Uh, Josh, hello, thank you for being here as well. Uh, Sarah Whitney, uh, Sarah is assistant professor 
in the Center on Climate Change and Planetary Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Sarah, thank you. And then finally online, uh, we have uh, Salim, Salim Abdul Karim. Salim is the Caprisa Professor of Global Health at Columbia University. It's a paradox that precisely the person from Columbia University <laughs> is online and the rest of us uh, uh, and the rest of us are here. But, but it, it, it's a, it's a, a, I think that uh, we will enjoy uh, listening to, to Salim as well. So uh, um, I, I apologize in advance because some of them requested to, to put the slides. I, I, I'd rather had a, a more um, conversational uh, space here today because we don't have a, a, such a long time. So we prepare a few questions uh, for, for all of you. And we are going to start with you, Salim, if, if you're okay, if you're okay uh, 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 with that. No? And I know, Salim, that uh, right now you are focusing part of your work on uh, the topic of pandemic preparedness and response, which is something uh, extremely relevant for all of us uh, right now, particularly in the aftermath of the of the pandemic. Although I would like to come back later to to, to what extent uh, uh, everybody is as scared as, as as we all were just a few months a few months ago. No, but uh, Salim, uh, your work now, uh, uh, as as you told me, uh, is uh, on the early identification of potential new potential threats for each of the four modes of transmission that a new pandemic could have. No? So my questions are very simple uh, uh, for you. First of all, well, first of all, I think it would be great if you could if you could share with us which are those four modes uh, that uh, you are exploring uh, right now. And then what have we learned uh, from COVID in that regard? What is it that we should be doing differently from what we did uh, before on the basis of your of your research? If you can respond to that, uh, in this seven, 10 minutes maximum, I think we can go. Thank you, Salim, go ahead. So thank you very much, Gonzalo, and a very warm greeting to all of you. I'm currently talking to you from Durban in South Africa, where I am based at the Nelson R. Mandela School of Medicine. So I'm sorry I'm not there with you in person at Columbia University, but know that I'm with you in spirit. So I... Um, in uh, in looking at the COVID-19 pandemic, there are several important lessons that we can take away in order to be better prepared for the next pandemic. And one of those is the importance of ensuring that we have in place systems for early detection and the surveillance infrastructure that that involves. So part of my responsibility as special advisor uh, on pandemics to the director general of the WHO is to look at exactly that question because it became clear to us that we needed to have these kinds of early uh, information. Now we saw that probably most clearly in COVID-19 when it came to Omicron. When we first discovered the Omicron variant here in South Africa, it, it was within a matter of two to three days from the time we first identified it in the laboratory to the time we publicly announced it. And as soon as we announced it, you know, the whole world <laughs> came down on us and instituted travel bans. And so that meant now that we couldn't get supplies, especially important supplies that we needed for our laboratories to continue our surveillance. So we need to do better on that front. So what does an early warning system involve? Well, we need to know what kinds of organisms we are looking for. And principally, we are focusing on the four modes of transmission. So the one that we worry about most is respiratory uh, organisms, ones that are spread uh, through breathing to speaking through, uh, but they come out through the nose and the mouth. And COVID-19 is a good example. Influenza is another example. The second that we worry about is an organism that is spread through gastrointestinal transmission. So that's through contaminated water or contaminated food, where we eat it. And a classic example of that is cholera. Then the third kind of transmission we are concerned about is sexual transmission. And here we've seen 
Uh, HIV is a good example of a sexually transmitted pandemic. And more recently, what we had was the, the pandemic of MPOX, which was being spread through close contact, not sexually, but sexually related through close contact. So that's the third mode of transmission, sexual transmission, where we worried about gonorrhea, syphilis, and HIV. And then finally, uh, 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 organisms that are spread through intermediate hosts. And there we most worry about tick-borne or uh, any other kind of uh, organism. So there we, we worry about Lyme disease, Ebola, and so on. And those are spread through organisms, uh, through intermediate uh, hosts. So those are the four we worry about. So when we look at all four, what is the common uh, variable that leads us to identify them early. The common variable, and almost every pandemic, is first identified by clinicians. They are doctors working in hospitals and clinics that first, that see the patient first. And the reason for that is that we actually, at that stage, do not know what the cause of the pandemic is. So if you take COVID-19, Dr. Lee, when he first saw patients at the Wuhan District Hospital, and he was very concerned about the undiagnosed pneumonia cases he was seeing, and he wrote a letter to the district authorities, and they ignored his letter. So he went on social media to, to talk about the undiagnosed pneumonia that he was seeing. It was a reflection of his frustration. Here as a clinician, he was picking something up. It's something different, something unusual. We couldn't pick it up through a laboratory. Can't be done through a laboratory because we didn't even know what the organism was at the time. So clinicians are a central part of our early identification system. When you think back to HIV, you know, HIV, we only understood the organism that caused it, you know, about four years. Uh, no, not four years, about two to three years after the first cases. So we had no idea how to even test for HIV. These were cases that were being picked up clinically. So that means we have to have clinicians that are observant, clinicians that are looking for unusual cases and looking for clusters of cases. And clinicians, when they see these clusters, will report them to authorities. And then, of course, we're dealing with the next challenge is that when the health authorities receive such a, a report, that they know how to sift through them because they will just be inundated. They have to work out which of the reports are important that they need to act on and which they can ignore. And once they do that, then they need to have the capacity to investigate and to then take it forward as a potential outbreak. So all of those steps involve the ability of local health services and local doctors to be able to identify these cases and the health authorities to act on them. And principally, if you look at this stage, we have no international early warning system that deals with that because that's just dealt with at an individual level, country by country or district by district or hospital by hospital. So we have to create some kind of standards, some kind of mechanism, some kind of support structure that would support clinicians with their early identification and reporting. Because once we move beyond that, then comes the investigation, then comes the identification of the organism, then comes the laboratory testing. That usually follows a little while later. So I hope I've given you some idea of the enormity of the challenge of setting up a clinical early warning system since none exists at a global coordinated level at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Salim. Uh, really interesting and i think that uh, maybe later if we have the time we could we could talk a little bit about uh, the component of 
of equity in the investment in these early warning systems. And we've been following, for instance, uh, uh, the challenge of early warning systems in Sub-Saharan in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is one of the I think that's uh, uh, one of the of the challenges that we have at international as an international community. And maybe we can we can follow that. No, uh, Josh, let me let me continue uh, uh, with you. And let's not focus on the role of health systems and the health uh, sector more more particularly. And um, I am interested in your in your line of research and work about a uh, one critical aspect uh, of the uh, links between health and climate, which is how to adapt the health sector to climate change, both in terms of uh, making it more resilient and in terms of providing a role uh, as a decarbonization uh, uh, factor. No, in the if you could tell us a little bit more about this. Sure. Thank you, Gonzalo. Um, so it's interesting. I think. It, when we think about early warning systems, the health sectors had a pretty big early warning that climate change is going to impact human health and our health systems. Um, people in the health sector have been doing this research and building this understanding for more than 25 years. I'm looking here at Guto Galvao, who is one of the one of the leaders in, in that effort for for a long time, and. Um, you know, it's it's only been in more recent years that the um, the sectors begun to pay attention to that, um, and it's it's really interesting to have Salim talking to us from the Nelson Mandela Medical School in um, in Durban. In that, um, uh, I was there in 2011 for I forget what COP number it was of the climate negotiations, but it was the first ever global climate and health summit that we co-organized with the Nelson Mandela Medical School there and a number of other partners, um, WHO and others, um, to begin to sort of raise this issue and raise it up. And the pandemic in many ways gave us an early warning around climate change. It, it began to, it showed us what a multidimensional crisis on a planetary scale might look like. Um, and in many ways, um, the health impacts of climate change will make the COVID-19 pandemic pale in comparison unless we're able to uh, reverse course very quickly and we only have a few years left to do so. Um, so what does that mean for the health sector itself? Uh, healthcare is impacted by the climate crisis. It's impacted by extreme weather events. It's impacted by the migration of um, different infectious diseases. Um, it is it, many other health problems are exacerbated by climate's impacts. Um, and ultimately, as um, uh, climate change impacts uh, civilization's ability to produce food and for people to inhabit certain places, um, we're going to see different um, serious migration events that are going to impact human health in a, in a significant way and our health systems. Um, uh, there's a threat of health system collapse over time. Um, as climate change continues to uh, generate health problems. So the health, our health systems need to become more resilient and they need to adapt. But the other part of the, the other side of the coin here is that the health sector actually contributes to the problem. It's part of the problem. So um, in 2019, we came out with a study that found that healthcare's climate footprint globally, it was the first ever global study of healthcare's footprint, there have been different national studies done, was equivalent to 4.4% of net global greenhouse gas emissions. That means if healthcare were a country, it would be the fifth largest greenhouse gas emitter on the planet. This was a fairly surprising conclusion and finding, uh, especially to those in the health sector, because many people hadn't really thought about that before. Um, and that finding was corroborated by a number of other studies. And in fact, between that was based on 2014 data, between 2014 and 2019, healthcare's footprint actually grew from 4.4% to 5.2% of net global emissions. So one of the things that we and our colleagues at WHO, we at Healthcare Without Harm, our colleagues at WHO and others set out to do was to begin to put in place uh, a series of initiatives to support the transformation of the healthcare sector so that it aligned its, uh, we aligned global health goals with the ambition of the Paris Agreement to get to net zero emissions by 2050. 
Um, so that means healthcare needs to decarbonize. Healthcare needs to become resilient, adapt to climate change, and get to net zero. That's a tall order. That's major systems change. Um, and so how does that happen? I mean, I think that's the question, and that's sort of one of the questions of um, uh, this that, that you organize this meeting for is like, how does systems change like that happen? Um, one of the things that we've learned is that, and it's sort of an obvious lesson, is that you've got to organize from the bottom up. Um, and uh, nobody really knows what net zero healthcare looks like yet, but there are a number of hospitals and health systems, in fact, thousands now around the world that are implementing decarbonization measures, whether that's around uh, clean renewable energy, uh, green and uh, zero carbon buildings, transport, um, reduction of waste, there's a, and, and transforming the supply chain, which is 70% of, of healthcare's footprint. In other words, 70% of healthcare's footprint is what healthcare consumes, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, production of food, all of this stuff, right? So we have hospitals and health systems across Brazil that are moving in this direction. We have major health systems here in New York City that are moving in this direction, in India, in South Africa. Uh, in Europe. And so there's a global movement of hospitals and health systems that are that are doing this. But um, and so many of them have joined the UNFCCC race to zero, which is a commitment to to net zero emissions. There's um, 70 institutions representing about 14,000 hospitals and health centers in more than 20 countries now that are doing that. But that's not enough, right? I mean, that without government mandate and without commitment at that level, um, you can't have the kind of change that 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 we need to see in the world. Um, and so in the, in the lead up to COP26 in Glasgow, we began working with WHO and the COP presidency, the UK COP presidency to um, get a number of governments to begin to be the early adopters, the, the initial committers around getting to um, low carbon climate resilient health systems. And we thought we'd maybe get like five governments by the time we got to Glasgow. But by the time we got to Glasgow, there were 52 national health ministries that made this commitment. Um, and uh, that was a stunning amount. Why? Um, people have been waking up, right? Everybody sees the climate crisis is happening. Everybody saw what the pandemic could do. Um, and people are starting to see that it's possible to make the change. And so all of these factors converged. Um, and we're able to sort of get this commitment. That's now up to 76 national health ministries, including Brazil, which just recently joined what's called the Alliance for Transformational Action on Climate and Health, which is anchored at WHO. So we have these national commitments. Um, we have the G20 governments just reinforce that commitment, committing to low carbon climate resilient health care. Um, and now we've got to actually make it happen. And so the interplay between that action on the ground and this, these government commitments needs to now spiral in a positive way, in a virtuous uh, uh, positive spiral to actually begin to implement this transformational change. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Josh. Actually, as you're in, in your role as a lead of global partnerships, uh, I think it would be interesting later to talk a little bit about this improbable new coalitions that have been formed precisely to, to provoke these changes that we are discussing here. Let's move now to, to Sara. Sara, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you are now working on something that I think is particularly interesting for this for this conversation. It is actually very much related to what we have heard in the, in the previous round table, which is how to design and implement a, a effective climate mitigation uh, actions that uh, will improve the health and well-being of citizens in cities in particular, and this is your this is your focus, no? So uh, again, I wonder if you could tell us more about this line of research and, and in the context of this conversation. Thank you, yes. So I think obviously uh, um, I'd like to sort of echo a lot of the points that were made that were made earlier in the first couple of panels. I think it's worth acknowledging that um, without mitigation that the limits at which we'll be able to adapt to the to the changes that, that are posed by climate change. We're going to have increased health costs and uh, those are going to become more and more devastating. So we need mitigation actions that are well designed to make the space for adaptation. So we can't have one without the other. Um, and what I think it's worth really highlighting is that the opportunity and the, the potential solutions that exist within mitigation actions that are well designed 
across all sectors. Um, and obviously we've heard from Josh about, about what can be done in the health sector, but those, those actions can also have big health co-benefits uh, in the near term, as, as well as reducing the, the longer term impacts from climate change, such as heat and exposure to extreme events. Um, they, um, these actions can also promote health through things like improved air quality, energy access, healthy diets, increased physical activity. Um, and so what we've been trying to do uh, at, with the, at the London School for the last three years is to sort of map the uh, both the modelled and implemented evidence because I think as we heard we heard earlier what we really need are case studies and examples of these actions to inspire and promote change and also to look at the barriers and potential failures so so one thing that that's really helpful is to look at where implementation hasn't worked uh, so what we've been doing with the Pathfinder initiative over the last three years is to map both the peer-reviewed model evidence and we've been working also with partners including SDSN, uh, C40 Cities, uh, CDP and uh, the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research to to identify implemented actions would have, which have um, both measured quantified the emission reductions that are that are possible looked at the barriers and also looked at the health benefits and the and the other equity benefits and i think just to give you some of our highlights our first report will come out in um uh, november this year i think what what you can take away is obviously that the context is very important so the context that you work in uh, that your action is being taken in is very important you need that local buy-in to identify the, the actions that will deliver the biggest benefits in your situation, um, but that there, there are significant health care benefits. I think one of the issues that we found is that people are not monitoring and measuring and evaluating these actions at the local scale at the moment. Um, and what's really needed, I think this was sort of also highlighted by the global stock cake uh, that came out like last week. Um, we see that it's not just that things are being monitored um, and not being monitored, but that also that the scale of implementation is currently too slow. So we really need to have better evidence at the scale, at the local scale to accelerate that action. And also, but to know if we're spending the money wisely and to understand the barriers that we face and how to overcome them. Um, and also things like creating a just and equitable future. So how do different sorts of mitigation actions affect different sectors of society and how can we include the most vulnerable sectors of society in, in designing well-designed actions to promote health and uh, other kinds of benefits as well. I think we've seen some really good examples and some and some good recommendations on how we need to come together to foster partnerships. And so what we would like to do for the next phase of our project, so this is a bit of a plea and an advert as well, is that we, we've kind of spent three years looking at what evidence is already out there we will be sharing that evidence within our report. So that will come out. We're going to identify, we've um, got a website to share different case studies and uh, we'll be having some workshops to sort of roll out those studies as well. And um, we have also looked for good examples of which take a systems approach, which we also think is vitally important. But I think uh, this is one of the challenges you can, I think that it was highlighted earlier. You can get people together to talk about how you take a systems approach. You can get experts, but when you're trying to engage cities to get them to undertake those actions, you need these examples um, of a systems approach being implemented to really get that action to be taken. Um, and I think, yeah, coming together to foster partnerships between different sectors of society, multi-level. So getting the signals from governments and from international agreements down to take action at the city level is very important. Um, and as I said, understanding, fostering a community where we can learn from failures and learn what best practice looks like for different sectors and for different sorts of actions would be very important. And one thing we really need to guard against is both greenwash and health wash with these different actions. So undertaking actions, promoting them as things that are, that are, that potentially are good for health without understanding whether those benefits are being realized and at what scale they're being realized. So I think uh, what we're hoping to do over the next three years of the project is to become more prospective. So we'll be trying to engage with different initiatives like the 100 Smart Cities to develop uh, guidelines and standards by which we can um, evaluate these outcomes to help cities to understand the opportunities that they could have 
and also how to measure and monitor those effectively and, and cost effectively as well, because obviously that's very important. Um, but I think it is worth noting that every 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 dollar, every pound, every every euro spent on on mitigation actions that also health health and equity benefits we aren't capturing those benefits at the moment so we don't know what what they but what those benefits are we don't know what the avoided um healthcare costs from reductions in air pollution could be from moving towards uh more renewables for example and just to sort of finish up because i know we don't have long i think it's also worth thinking about that systems approach and taking that planetary health focus um we know that the, the evidence is quite strong for major benefits in things like transformation of the food system, physical activity, reductions in air pollution. But there are also real significant benefits from actions that integrate adaptation and mitigation, uh, so-called by the IPCC is now moving towards calling it climate um, resilient development. Um, I mean, land-based actions um, in things like agroforestry could have significant benefits for rural workers, protecting against heat impact. Um, restoring and protecting coastal ecosystems can buffer against extreme events. That's been known for some time. Um, but likewise, green cities, um, combining planning infrastructure, um, improve physical activity. They can also promote mental health and protect against flooding and, and also reduce things like the, herb the, the urban heat island effect. But while the evidence is quite good on the adaptation benefits sometimes for um, green infrastructure, understanding the mit potential mitigation benefits and that whole causality chain, looking at health, mitigation, adaptation together, I think is one, is one avenue that we could really sort of improve on in the next few years. And it would be great to see some more actions looking at these in more holistic ways. And I think those are really quite important to to think about those sort of trade-offs and unavoidable un unintended consequences that we want to avoid. So that's why this is a great conference to be at in terms of thinking about these things in that rounded way so we can sort of minimize the disbenefits and maximize all the different sorts of potential benefits that are on offer. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sara. Uh, let us finish the, this first round with you, uh, Ethel. I, I wanted to finish with you because I think that you have a very unique perspective. You 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 come also from the academic sector uh, yeah. you are also a practitioner uh, you are a, you or i don't know if you are now but you've been a columnist uh, you've been engaged in the challenge of disinformation as well in yeah. uh, uh, in brazil and now you are in government in a gigantic laboratory for many of these things that we are talking about such as brazil that goes yeah. uh, beyond and so my question is very open what is your experience, the lessons that uh, you would like to share with us in terms of what you are doing in the Brazilian government? Thank you very much, Gonzalo. Uh, first, I would like to apologize my English as a non-native speaker, and uh, I will do my best to express myself here. Um, first, I, I, I need to give one step behind to explain what's happened in Brazil in the last four years and during the pandemic. So there are some concepts like democracy and science, we thought that was completely consolidated, but it was, was not. And uh, we have to stand up to, to this very important uh, word and, and concepts. So, and we think as a, a scientist, uh, the world will be like applaud us because we so fast has the diagnosis, the vaccine, some medicine. So this is a wonderful for the science uh, point of view. But in Brazil, we became a number one enemy of the nation. So we were uh, threatened of death. Uh, we were constantly. Um, uh, afraid of our lives. So it's a very complicated moment in, in Brazil to be a scientist, to be, to be uh, people that work with this, this very important world. And um, we have this misinformation that was uh, spread by the government. So it's a completely different from other parts of the world, because for the first time in our country, we have our institution 
saying against science and uh, stand up against science. So it's we we as a scientist we do not know how to manage this because it's a completely different uh, environment that we were on that time in the pandemic. Uh, so this is, I think, is the the first lesson that we learn in a very hard way. It's the importance that we have like an independent institution like Fiocruz. Uh, Fiocruz play a very important role at that time because uh, Fiocruz stand by the science and uh, with this new government that uh, just starting in January, we we have this opportunity with the former president of the Fiocruz became the, the, the first woman Minister of Health in Brazil. So this is like a, a huge, uh, a huge change for all of us. Um, and um, the second lesson that I, I do like to 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 think about is the way that we are dealing with the Amazon region, and uh, the way that we in this new government diagnoses the um, the lack of health service the lack of, of uh, laboratory facilities in this area, in this very important area for the world. And um, one quick example, when we, we have this, this gamma variant in Brazil, uh, it was detected in Japan because uh, a Brazilian uh, couple traveled for Japan and when they went there, they realized that this a new variant. So uh, this is the problem that we don't have enough uh, laboratory facilities and health facilities in the in this area. So this is right now, it's a big challenge for our government. We already say, uh, take this for the President Lula that uh, in this new uh, accelerate program to develop in Brazil, he will put a lot of money to develop this region as with the health facility and lab and surveillance facility in this area. And this means also um, strength the education in this area to have, a, in at least in every city, one, uh, one, one person that was certificated as a field epidemiology to make this, this. so you have to, to make like a completely change in Brazil because right now we have no one with this with this uh this this certificate uh like Tefnet and and other in this in this area so this is uh put us in a lot of uh pressure because you have to in a short period of time to do a lot of of changes in this in this part and the the third lesson that I would uh point it's the, um, the need for local production that in Brazil, when you are talking about medication and vaccine, you have to think about more than 200 million inhabitants. Uh, so it's, it's everything that there is a lot of the scale, you have to scale up uh, all of this. And local production is very important because we are universal health system. And we, we provide everything free of charge for our population. Uh, and it depends if they are Brazilian or not Brazilian. And uh, because migrants is very important in this, in this area too. And it is new for us. We didn't have like a policy and health policy and environment policy for migrants because it's, it's not a reality, but it's became a, a reality since the Venezuela crisis. And we have our border with like 500 people each day entering the country. So it, it have a, it's, it's a, a, a new challenge for us uh, to build a uh, uh, policy for these migrants that are in, in our country right now. So I think with these three uh, points, uh, I, I'm a very optimistic person. So I, I have to, the idea that we are more prepared, but in not in the end of the pandemic, but before the end of the pandemic, the world uh, is facing a war. And uh, 
it it's for us that wants to work together and make partnership and for the next pandemic it's very important to build this relationship and relationship is built by transparency and transparency we need trust each other and uh, I'm not sure if we, we are more open than we were before. So I think it's very important to be here. And I'm, I'm very honored. And uh, I'm, I'm open to, to answer your questions. And thank you very, thank much. You very much. Thank you, Ethel. I think it was uh, really interesting. We have uh, something about 10, 15 minutes, 15 minutes maximum before the, 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 the people uh, starts to riot uh, to get their lunch. Uh, uh, so um, I'm going to look, uh, Sophia, to the to the questions that uh, that I got, but let me make a follow-up question to you, SL, open to the to the panel, because I think it's relevant for all of you. To what extent do you think that the window of opportunity in terms of public opinion, in terms of policy space that we had during the pandemic and in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic is closing. To what extent uh, this sense of urgency that we had, for instance, Salim, when it came to early warning system, in terms of uh, local production, I, I, I never thought I would see in my life a, a US president supporting a, a waiver for the intellectual property uh, agreement at the WTO, uh, things that we thought that uh, were, uh, to what extent uh, people simply have moved on. We now are talking about Ukraine, about uh, China, and we are losing that sense of urgency. Uh, and the, uh, Or you believe that something is structural change and we still have that opportunity to, to introduce. Whoever wants to, to respond. Uh, Ethel, go, go ahead first. Um, in Brazil, the window of opportunity is very open right now. And uh, and we think that we have a very good moment. Uh, is for for the first time we have all the minister of health uh, with technical person. Uh, the minister of health don't have a political party. I don't have political party, and this is very unusual in Brazil. So it's it's open a very good opportunity to us to do what we need to do. Thank you. Um, I I I think I think that there is a growing momentum because it's not okay. So maybe the 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 initial backlash from sort of COVID, the initial push, has decreased. But I mean, look at this year. You know, the 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 number and and scale of the different impacts that El Nino's caused. Uh, you know, there is something every year that you know you think the ukraine push up energy crisis you know in the uk if we if we'd invested more in renewables we would have we would have had significantly you know i think there's an estimate that our our energy bills would have been on average 150 pounds lower per year if if the uk had invested strategically and more forcefully in renewable energy before ukraine so there is something every year now so i think you know what one thing may may dip away but you know the 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 momentum is building and not you know not in a good way but hopefully that pressure can can keep up and we can keep the momentum moving thank you sarah yours please and then salim we, we can go to you please so I, I mean i think it's a paradox <laughs> in that you know we saw with the pandemic that rapid change is possible right that's that civilization that all of our societies can move quickly to address a crisis and and do it in some ways, fairly well, with all the critique that we might have around the pandemic. Um, and at the same time, it certainly feels now like we're kind of back to business as usual. Um, and so those two things kind of coexist. And then what Sarah's saying is is true as well in that, um, you know, in, in to just put it in the experience that we have and what I was talking about, we've seen nonlinear transformational change in the health sector's approach around climate change. That's certainly true. And at the same time, we're seeing nonlinear transformational change that is outstripping that change in terms of the climate crisis. And so um, I think the jury's out whether we're going to be able to actually take those positive lessons about how quick change can happen and make it happen in order to address some of the planetary health issues that we're facing today. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Salim, uh, you want to 
Salim, is just that... a quick point, if I oh, might yeah, uh, chip in, just to say that you know, there's no question that we are going to see more pandemics and more organisms emerge because climate change is a principal driver of much of that. So we are, are very likely to be in a situation where we're going to see new pandemics coming. And I think that among the lessons we've learned from COVID is the central importance of global equity in access to countermeasures, whether they are diagnostic tests or vaccines or treatments. And that we understand that in the next global crisis, when we face with the same problems, we're going to have to figure a way how to get access to critical uh, countermeasures such as vaccines. And the WHO has already invested in creating an mRNA hub in South Africa. But the big problem is not the capability. It's not the money. It's not the equipment. The big problem is the intellectual property. And the intellectual property remains the biggest obstacle because you can't make an mRNA vaccine without treading on intellectual property already owned by either Moderna or BioNTech. And so we've got to address that problem as part of parcel of the overall problem. And I've been getting somewhat disillusioned with the pandemic treaty negotiations because the draft zero had very good language on this issue of dealing with intellectual property in a pandemic situation. And countries have just walked all that back. It's completely out right now. There's not even a single paragraph on it in the current version that's being debated. And I think if we're not serious about addressing that problem, we're not gonna fix the problem of global equity to things like vaccines. Thank you very much, Salim. And, and thank you because your response is very much related to the to the next question as well, because one of the questions from the from our audience is about the role the 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 role of different sectors in moving uh, things uh, forward no and the question is in, in particular what sector is the most advanced in implementing these systemic transformations and addressing risks to human and planetary health whether it's the public sector that is taking the lead uh, we are we are all reading mariana matsukato's take for instance on the role of the of the public sector as as a leading entrepreneur at the public level or the private or even international organizations. Salim was just mentioning the pandemic treaty or what as they call it now, the pandemic agreement. They are now watering down uh, these two. Uh, we are seeing a pandemic fund that is clearly underfunded uh, in terms of the, of the request. Uh, where do you think uh, the the passion is coming from, and the and the push is coming from in this in this regard, and, and whether this has changed or not? Who wants to <laughs> go ahead? Please. In Brazil, is the public public health? Yeah, yeah, it's leading for the minister Marina Silva, and uh, she is uh, in in leader this this movement in Brazil by and all the the development for accelerate the infra, infrastructure infrastructure in Brazil uh has to be green right now so there's this this commitment with all the the parts of the government to be this way Josh, what do you think so there's change happening in almost every sector of society um and none of it's enough so what I would say is it's more of a question of where the change needs to come from. And that change needs to come from a much more diverse and vibrant social movement that's advocating for a rapid transition away from our societal dependence on fossil fuels, um, which are causing huge climate, environmental and health problems and toward a, a, a rapid adoption of clean, renewable healthy energy. And without that social movement, which includes advocacy from health professionals as a key piece of it, um, the changes that we need to see happen aren't going to happen. So uh, uh, the vice minister and, and, and the health ministry in Brazil and the environment ministry in Brazil need those social movements pushing from below in order to make good policy. And that that's the case everywhere in the world. Yeah, I think I would I would echo Josh's point. I think the health the health community has has played a significant role and and is really stepping up to become advocates for planetary health and for the phase out of fossil fuels. And I think when when doctors start to stand up and talk about these things, people do listen in a way that they may not listen to politicians. Um, and I I do agree that change does 
need to come from the bottom up, but I think it also needs to come from the top down. We need to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. They could be redirected into other, you know, into healthcare subsidies and, and why not? And that would promote resilience. I'm curious about your role as academics because we have these friends uh, in the in the Spanish section of SDSA in, in Redes called Fernando Valladares. He's one of the most prestigious scientists in, in, in Spain, uh, working on climate, he's being an, in the last couple of years, maybe three years, he has almost, um, I wouldn't say abandoned, but he has sidelined his scientific agenda in the benefit of a much more public uh, role, the kind of social movement uh, role in the, and I'm finding finding that more and more. Uh, scientists, the thing that uh, um, we need some kind of shake, public shake, and, and, and in, in that sense, the pandemic maybe played that role. El Nino and what is happening and what happened this, this summer, people are, are scared, but we need that, we need that kind of, of, uh, of push, no? even more emotional, no, Josh? So the health sector and health professionals have more than a hundred year history of organizing for social transformation and social change. And that history and that experience drawing on that and applying it to the current crises and the current issues, I think is the key thing here. And as Sarah just said, the health voice, health professional voice um, is in poll after poll, country after country, the most respected voice nurses first doctors second um and so when 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 health professionals talk about these issues they're listened to and sometimes the politics shifts around and it, you know it becomes a, a a challenge to be articulate about these issues um and at the same time if you look at coming out of the pandemic despite some of the undermining of the health sector's reputation because of that politics it's still a powerful and respected voice and perhaps even more so in many places because of the pandemic. Thank you, Josh. And uh, don't forget don't Salim. Know, Salim, yeah, I don't know if you want to add something on this on this point. Yes, just very quickly, just to say that uh we saw during COVID, and certainly we saw it during HIV in South Africa, where you know the politicians and our president went into denial that HIV was a cause of AIDS. And it was the scientists and the clinicians who stood up and said, you know, we have to follow the science. And that has become much more clearer and a stronger voice during COVID. And I think that clinicians play this important role. But I want to warn that we also have clinicians playing the opposite role, where they are you know, anti-vax and they are promoting an anti-vax agenda. They are promoting unproven treatments like ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. So, you know, uh, medical people can be just as destructive as they can be constructive in dealing with the challenges we're facing with information and science. I think that's that's a, certainly a very good point. No? Let me finish with a, with a well. It's not it's not a, a I mean it's a quick question, not so quick response. But uh, I do not want to miss it. Uh, also from the from the audience, does any of the panelists have any insights on the gender perspective of health in some of the mitigation and adaptation actions? Um, from from a mitigation perspective, um, I think that there is there are some big opportunities to be to be gained for to improve gender equity um, especially from things like transitions to clean cook stoves the the mitigation benefits are, are not so significant but the health and time saving aspects um, to free up women to um, be able to undertake further education and take their time away from uh, gathering fuel it are significant alongside the health impacts which uh, can occur and and we've seen some really nice examples as well in the, in the work we've been looking for in in city based actions where they've not only promoted uh, increased use of public transport but making those systems safer to use as well so women feel more empowered to to access them even late at night and and so yeah I think there are some really good examples I think when you look more broadly the uh, I know it's always the most boring thing to say, but we need more data. We need more information to be able to map out those those inequities. Um, but I think, yeah, there there are significant opportunities from well designed actions. Thank you very much, Sara. I'm afraid that we we need to leave it there because it's uh, we are almost on time. Thank you so much for the for it was 
really interesting to listen to listen to you. I hope it was interesting to you and to the people that are are uh, online in the. And I leave the leave the the floor to the organizers uh, for a final for closing the the formal. Thank you very much. Thank. You. Thank you all so very much for this wonderful panel and all these great insights that uh, you have all shared with us. Um, now, uh, let's see um, if we have online our um, last speaker for uh, today's event, um, Sir Andy Haynes, who uh, is invited here today, uh, joining us remotely, and who will be providing some uh, closing remarks for uh, for these uh, three panel sessions that we've uh, had. Uh, so, um, uh, Professor uh, Andy Haynes is a professor of uh, environmental change and public health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, he has been recognized for his contributions in understanding the effects of climate change on public health and for his also mentorship for the next generations of uh, scientists and sustainability practitioners in the 21st century. Um, so uh, he will share with us uh, some of his concluding thoughts, and um, I take this opportunity also to encourage you to register for the events that will follow uh, this one at 1.30 p.m. New York time um, on multi-stakeholder uh, engagement and, and cooperation. We will be dropping the link in, in the chat. So without further ado, uh, Sir Andy Haynes, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much for the introduction. Can I just check you can hear me, first of all? Yes, very well. Good. Um, I did have some slides, but I think because time is a bit short and I think everyone must be hungry and tired after a long session, I'll just speak without slides. I first of all wanted to thank the organisers for inviting me and secondly, to compliment really all the speakers and the panellists today. It's really been um, a remarkably productive session. I've been listening to the whole lot. It's been uh, really, I think, very fruitful and shared so much uh, wisdom. So I just wanted to share a few takeaway thoughts myself. And one of the uh, papers that's most uh, impressed me in the last week or so is the recent report on planetary boundaries. And what it shows us, pu published in Science Advances just last week, is really, I guess, what we all know, but it's nevertheless worrying to be confirmed that you know, there are these nine planetary boundaries, including climate, biodiversity, land use change, nitrogen, phosphorus, ocean acidification, and so on. And six of the nine uh, really are being exceeded right now. And of the remaining three, one is about to be exceeded, that's the ocean acidification. The other one, which is aerosols, well, it's already killing millions of people from air pollution. So the only partial success we have is stratospheric ozone depletion, all the rest going in very much the wrong direction. And these boundaries, of course, interact, which brings us back to the whole theme of this talk, which is about systems. So single interventions are going to have moderate effect. But what we really need, of course, is systems thinking to address these multiple boundaries at the same time. So, for example, if we just focus on actions that will, say, address the freshwater boundary, we won't tackle the burgeoning issue of biodiversity loss or climate change. And there's always a danger, of course, of having an intervention which addresses one boundary, but doesn't tend to take into account the others. For example, if we just depend on hydropower, and as we've heard, precipitation, rainfall decreases in some regions, uh, then we may end up without uh, sufficient uh, electricity and sufficient energy. So we are now living, of course, in a new um, geophysical epoch, the Anthropocene. And the problem we have is that our institutions, including our universities, our governments, our political systems, all grew up in the Holocene. The Holocene was, of course, that long period um, from which, uh, during which humanity uh, transitioned from being um, basically uh, migrants and, and uh, migrant hunters and so on, hunter gatherers, into agriculturalists and then into urban dwellers. And during that 10,000 years or so, we saw a dramatic transformation of the landscape, of the both the landscape of this planet, the atmosphere, the oceans, and so on. And these multiple changes are now threatening to undermine the very real progress that we have seen in recent decades. And as we've heard, these changes threaten health in so many different ways, right the way from, from heat 
communicable diseases, as Slim Karim has, has very eloquently described, the effects of air pollution, the effects of floods and droughts, increasing poverty, and so on and so on. And that just emphasizes, again, the need for systems approaches. Of course, we do need specific interventions. We need better vaccines. We need um, early warning systems and so on. But we also have to think about it holistically, because as we've heard, we have to combine um, adaptation uh, and mitigation if we're going to be successful. What we do know is that merely uh, telling individuals that everything is bad, that there are multiple threats, is not necessarily going to precipitate the kind of change that we want. And there's growing evidence that uh, having a positive message around health and the environment is much more likely to foster public support, particularly amongst those people who may be doubtful, who may be misinformed about environmental change. And so this, I think, is important to keep this positivity, even in times when we know many negative things are happening. I was really delighted to hear a lot of endorsement of the idea of integrated action for, for health and for the climate and for the planet because we need to combine mitigation and adaptation. And for far too long, these two communities have worked separately. The adaptation, adaptation folks coming from, whether it be disaster uh, management or whatever, um, whereas the mitigation people coming from food systems um, or uh, of course, energy as well. So we need to combine some of these insights in order to create a much lower environmental impact, healthy and sustainable cities, and of course, um, healthcare systems uh, as well. And another important point that came out uh, from, from Josh and others is the important role of the healthcare system. And that's where adaptation and mitigation can be and should be and must be combined in order to reduce the burden on the health system, but also reduce the burden of the healthcare system on the environment. Because as Josh has reminded us, it's 5% of emissions. And if you include fresh water, um, air pollution, um, degradation of, of, of terrestrial systems and so on, then it's um, a, a, an even greater burden than that. So that is the healthcare system is one place where we can exemplify the need for both bottom up and top down policies to integrate adaptation uh, and mitigation. But we mustn't forget that there are also very big benefits that Sarah has alluded to from decarbonizing the economy as a whole. So if you look at the deaths from fossil fuel related air pollution, for example, there are over three and a half million a year people dying probably more than that, it's probably an underestimate. Physical inactivity is probably responsible for over 5 million deaths. And the best way of getting people active, of course, is through transport systems. Uh, gym membership, unfortunately, doesn't really work, but transport systems that emphasize public transport, walking and cycling are the best way to get people um, active at scale and also reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And our diets, of course, our diets, the food systems are dysfunctional. We have undernutrition, and obesity and overweight combined in many countries. And we know that the diet, dietary risk factors are responsible for perhaps 10 or 11 million deaths a year. And as the Eat Lancet Commission has informed us, if we changed our diet towards a planetary health diet, eating much more fruit and vegetable, less red uh, vegetables, less red meat and processed meat, we could probably prevent 10 or 11 million premature deaths by mid-century, something of that order. So we've heard how cities can be the catalyst for change. They can be laboratories for change. And cities, I think, are inspirational in many cases in the kind of activities that they're taking. And they, again, combine adaptation and mitigation, at least in the best practice that we're seeing in cities. And cities have an advantage because they are closer to the people. They can engage people in, in bottom-up as well as top-down initiative. And they can integrate um, objectives across a range of different um, endpoints, both environmental and health. So what needs to change in order to transform the system into a, a, an economy which supports human health and equity, as Slim has, has reminded us, within planetary boundaries? Well, of course, we need better technologies, but technologies by themselves won't solve the problems. We need better knowledge structures. We're not very good at integrating knowledge, as we've heard from John Thwaites. Our universities are often siloed and obsolete in the way that they generate um, knowledge and evaluate change. We also need to address power relationships, because one of the reasons we're not advancing now is because very powerful interests, of course, are opposing change. And they benefit from many of the perverse incentives that are in the system at the moment, fossil fuel subsidies being one of them. And if you take the IMF approach and include um, implicit subsidies, the cost of air pollution, climate change and so on, then that's some um, over 6% of global GDP. 
So making sure that we phase out those subsidies, redirect them to things that are socially useful and environmentally beneficial, um, as well as having realistic uh, carbon pricing will be a very important part of any solution. And these changes that we need, these transformational changes, of course, must result in the end in new behaviours, new lifestyles. But it's important, of course, not to blame individuals, nor should we put much of the costs onto poor populations. And that's been one of the problems with some of the initiatives that we've seen up to now, the Gilets jaunes problem, for example, in France. We have to be very careful in implementing and designing these interventions to make sure that they don't push poor people further into poverty or don't increase inequalities. So what we need to do is to identify the key tipping points for rapid social change. And we believe that health care benefits, the realization that there are many near term benefits from these policies can act as potential uh, tipping points, can reinforce them. We need also, and it, some people think of evaluation and research as a luxury, and I would dispute that. I think the danger is that if we just say that we're going to act, but there's no evaluation, then what we will have is large amounts of greenwash and po probably healthwash as well. So it's really important to embed evaluation in actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and sustain planetary health, to ensure that we learn the lessons, not just the successes, but the failures as well, because there will be failures, that we minimize trade-offs because there will be trade-offs as well as benefits. And we have to make sure that we minimize those in order to garner and sustain a public support. So there are many barriers, I think, um, that prevent implementation of the insights that we already have, the knowledge that we already have. And John mentioned, John Thwaites mentioned some of those, but I would say vested interest, very important. Organized denialism, particularly using uh, social media. Political short-termism, we have this fundamental conflict between a political system, which depends on getting re-elected every three to five years, and a planet which needs long-term policies. And therefore we need to get public support on our side and to um, actually counteract that perception that change is expensive and too difficult. What is too expensive and too difficult, of course, is continue with business as usual. That is what will divide us, drive us into disaster and will cause a great deal of added expense in the medium to long term. So we need to integrate top down thinking with bottom up and context specific actions and interventions, bringing along communities, including, of course, indigenous peoples in co-designing and co-implementing solutions and addressing some of the governance failures that are currently preventing us from moving forward. So it's important to have an overarching framework for change, and there isn't a single framework which I'm suggesting we endorse, but a framework should include the need to capitalize on potential for social contagion, not just for negative things, but for positive ideas and positive changes as well, sharing lessons from implemented actions, capitalizing on the co-benefits, including to health, of course, but also if we get it right, there can also be benefits to employment through healthy and productive livelihoods. We need to make sure that policymakers and the public understand the potential near-term co-benefits and take into account the economic value of those co-benefits, which will greatly offset many of the costs of the kind of changes uh, that we need to make. So in systems approaches, of course, feedback loops can retard progress, but they can also enhance progress. And so we need to ensure that we capitalize on the positive feedback loops that will take us more rapidly uh, to the sustainable future that we all want to see. And in concluding, let me remind you that we really have very short time to do this. We really have a decade or two at a maximum. So we have to move quickly. We don't have the luxury of waiting for the best available evidence before we, before we move on. We have to implement the best available evidence we have now, but evaluate, uh, evaluate, learn the lessons, and, and spread the news, spread the knowledge, work together, capitalize on intersectoral action and collaboration across multiple disciplines. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Heinz, for this uh, inspiring thoughts. And hopefully we leave the event with more knowledge and motivation to, to work on systemic solutions. And thank you so much again for RCMA and Impetus Projects for making this event possible. Uh, and now we invite everyone in the room to, to join the networking lunch and see you hopefully at 1.30 New York time for another event on multi-stakeholder approaches. And people online, you can still register using the chat. Thank you very much. <laughs>